Everybody ready? Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the City of Delray Beach's regular City Commission meeting, scheduled for Tuesday, June 1st, 2021, 4 p.m. Please call the roll. Mr. Frankel? Present. Ms. Cassell? Here. Mr. Bolston? Here. Ms. Johnson? Present. Mayor Petrolia? Here. Please stand for the pledge. Okay, at this point we are at the agenda approval uh, point of our uh, agenda. Is there any changes to the agenda? I would like to put a change forward. Um, I made it known to our city manager and our city attorney that my support for 7E is no longer there to be on the agenda. Anybody interested in supporting the removal? No. no. I'll support his request. I'd like to move it to the top of the list if we could. Okay, let's do that. I'm good with that. How about you? I'd move it to the top of the list. It seems there's a lot of people here who want to speak on. All right, so we'll bring it to 7A. A. Um, I'd like to move um, 6D to the regular agenda, um, just for op for discussion. It's a, 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 an agreement for a lease uh, a lot on parking. Uh, what number? Had some questions. Is that okay? What number? Uh, 6D, moving to 7BB. Okay, anything else? No. Seeing as there's none. Motion to approve agenda as amended. Changed. Second. Call the roll, please. Ms. Cassell? Yes. Mr. Bolston? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mayor Petrolia? Yes. Mr. Frankel? Yes. Okay, we have three presentations, and we're just going to start with the presentation of um, the United States flag. I believe this is um, going to be Chief Sims and Sergeant Scabaris. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mayor, Commission, City Manager, Lynn. This is mainly it's going to be his presentation, so I'd like to introduce Sergeant Scobaris. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming. I'm going to try to make this quick. I know I have three minutes of what I've been told. Um, for those of you who don't know, I'm a sergeant for our police department. Uh, I'm the uh, sergeant for our homicide detectives. And I'm also in the Naval Reserves. Uh, in 2019, we didn't uh, get your name. Give sure, me. Louis Scabers. Uh, in 2019, actually October of 19, I was mobilized to go overseas. Uh, I went overseas for a full year in the Horn of Africa. There was no shortage of support, especially for my police department. But today, I wanted to say thank you. I didn't come with a speech because I wanted it to sound genuine and sincere. More importantly to me, uh, the support from my wife and my three kids. So when I left, they were all under five, all three of them. So as you can see, just being a full-time mom and uh, working full-time for the city, and those of you who don't know, my wife Amanda is uh, the clean and safe administrator. And uh, she did great, but I wanted to say thank you to the city, all the departments, our coworkers, friends, family, even uh, the residents of the city, Project Holiday. Uh, there was no shortage for uh, support um, for them. So I wanted to present a flag that we had flown overseas. Mm -hmm. uh, during a mission, our aviation regiment was able to fly it. And I wanted to present it here uh, to the whole city. I can only fly so many. So um, this is for you all. And again, I want to say thanks. There was no shortage of offers for childcare. Apparently, while I was gone, there was some kind of uh, toilet paper shortage. <laughs> I, I don't understand it. Um, but uh, it made my job a lot easier knowing that she was taken care of while I was gone. So thank you very much. Hold on just a second. Okay. Well, I just want to say that if Sergeant Scabaris uh, didn't participate in the, uh, 
the toilet shortage. Uh, he hasn't lived, but uh, anyway, because we all experience that. I have a little something special for um, the sergeant as well. We want to give him one of our uh, tokens, um, so I'd like to do that as well. So this is for you from us. Okay. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank all of you all because we have several officers at the police department as part of the uh, reserve program and one of the four military branches and we have received nothing but support so I truly appreciate it thank you going through Memorial Day, it's just great when we have them coming home to us. Thank you. Praise to God. Okay, our second presentation is recognizing um, uh, Fire uh, Rescue, uh, Division of Ocean um, Rescue for uh, Beach, for our uh, Patrol of the Year Award. Good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor, evening, Deputy Chief. Mayor, Commissioners. Uh, Keith Tommy, your Fire Chief. I'm uh, very proud today to, uh, to be here with you guys to uh, present the uh, uh, Ocean Rescue with their Ocean Rescue of the Year Award for 2020. With me today is Chief Watton, the Division Chief of the Division, uh, Lieutenant Jamie Anderson and Lieutenant uh, Bryce Cloth. Uh, they're with me, they're gonna accept those awards. But I'd like to first give you a little something about Ocean Rescue. Some of the people may not know. Ocean Rescue Division protects 1.25 miles of our shoreline from eight lifeguard towers. That not only does it include our municipal beach, but it also includes Atlantic Dunes Park, for those of you who don't know that. They're also provided to service 365 days a year, seven days a week. Um, the division is uh, made up of Division Chief uh, Watton, Captain uh, Demarest, and Administrative Assistant. There's four lieutenants, two of them are here, uh, 13 full-time uh, lifeguards and 15 part-time lifeguards. Um, every year they have a beach attendance of about three million, it's like 2.7 million is about average that we have. Um, they do about 46 rescue water rescues uh, every year. They do 15 wave runner responses where they take the wave runner out to, to people that have me a capsized boat or somebody got out too far. Uh, they do EMS 911 major medical calls, they do about 28 per year. Uh, minor first aid calls, about 7,500. Uh, missing persons, they do about 15 of those a year. Preventative actions, they do 64,000 preventative actions a year. And public assist, they do another 63,000. Those are kind of important because what they do is they're making contact with our beachgoers and making sure they don't get in trouble and they stay out of harm's way, tell them where to swim. Um, they do code enforcement as well. They do 27, about 27 uh, co uh, code enforcements a year. Uh, Ocean Rescue is also certified by the United States Life Saving Association as a, an advanced agency which basically means every single lifeguard is, is, is trained up to the EMT level. And not only that, we have eight that are paramedics. So we have several different uh, programs that we have that we do uh, annually. We have the junior lifeguard program. So if you have anybody that wants to maybe want to, wants to be a lifeguard, come out and try that. Uh, we have a lifeguard competition that we do. We have an ocean mile swim. And we also have the surf festival as well. Uh, about the competition, we're very, our history is rich in competition dating back to 1988 uh, where they first attended their first national competition. They've competed in local, regional, and national competition. One of our most notable past competitors, Lieutenant Posta, who won the national title four times in the paddleboard race and three times in the surf ski race. She was also selected to the world team in 2000 that competed in Sydney, Australia. Um, this isn't the first time Ocean Rescue has won uh, the Beach Patrol of the Year Award. We've done it four other times, so this is our fifth time that we, we've done this accomplishment. Um, so it's nice to know that anybody visits our beach here in Delray Beach, that it's one of the safest beaches in South Florida, if not the country. So I'm very, very proud to have Ocean Rescue in the fire department as part of our division because they exemplify excellence in everything that they do. And Mayor, if you'd like to come down and, and present them with the, uh, with the award, I would love that. Okay. This is the certificate, and then yeah. this is the plaque. So you can give okay. one to one lieutenant and one to the other lieutenant. Okay. Well, thank you so much for your service. I think you're doing a great job. Of course, we, we appreciate 
appreciate you doing everything you're doing as well. So you want to take a picture? Yep. Here we go. Okay. You're doing a great job, guys. Thank you so much. Okay, and we are moving on to our next on the agenda for the presentations, which is for C, the 2021 Historic Preservation Board Awards. Take it away, Michelle. Hi, good afternoon, Mayor and City Commissioners and members of the audience. I'm Michelle Hoyland, Principal Planner with the Development Services Division, and I'm pleased to be here this afternoon to present the 2021 Historic Preservation Board Awards in honor of National Historic Preservation Month. It's just under 10 minutes. I'll go as fast as I can. <laughs> so the Historic Preservation Board Awards acknowledges owners of historic properties who have significantly contributed to the preservation of the city's historic resources. HPB voted on the award nominees on May 5th and then held a virtual award ceremony on May 19th. Each of the award winners were honored. This year's eligible projects were chosen from eight categories for projects that were previously approved by the board and have been fully completed within the last two years. The board also recognized three property owners who listed their properties to the local register of historic places. So without further ado, the board selected the property located at 246 North Swinton Avenue as the winner of the category contributing residential within the Old School Square Historic District. The property owners Jim and Marie Grabo received the award for the addition and alterations to this 1925 minimal traditional style residence. The existing residence and garage on the property had undergone modifications over the years changing its original exterior appearance. The owners worked to develop a plan to restore the main residence and to legally convert the garage in the rear to an additional unit. Next, the board selected the property located at 19 Dixie Boulevard for contributing residential Delida Park Historic District. The property owner, owner Olga Adler, received the award for the addition and alterations to this 1925 mission style residence. The facade of the structure was preserved, including the medallions that existed on the front of the home. The board selected the property located at 126 and 128 Southeast 7th Avenue as the winner in the category of contributing residential in the Marina Historic District. The property owners Price Patton and Roger Cope of Hideaway by the Sea received this award for their addition and alterations to this 1949 post-World War II mid-century modern style duplex. This structure was for sale for a long time and city staff had received several inquiries from developers who were interested in the process to demolish, to demolish the structure. If it weren't for the actions of the owners, that structure may not have been saved. Next, the board selected the property located at 1420 North Swinton Avenue as the winner in the individually designated residential properties category. The property owner, Blaine Minton, received the award for additions to this 1928 Georgian colonial style residence. The residence sits on about two acres of land. Prior to the improvements, the property was listed for sale and was threatened by demolition as developers seek to subdivide the property for several home sites. At the time, the property was not listed as a historic structure. Mr. Minton purchased the property, listed the structure to the local register, and then received approval from HPB for additions and alterations to the property. Next, the board selected 132 North Swinton Avenue as the winner of the category commercial contributing. You all may know this as AGT land, it's a landscape architect's office. 
A. Grant Thornbro of AGT Land received the award for preservation and restoration to this 1925 mission style structure. Once the project began, he learned that much of the exterior walls had begun to degrade. At one point, his contractor considered asking the board for demolition and reconstruction of sections of the building. But Mr. Thornbro worked through the renovation process to, to bring the full project forward without any demolition. He took great care in this careful reno renovation. Next, we have the property at 255 Northeast Swinton Avenue. The board selected this property as the winner of residential non-contributing. The owners, Megan and Jason Luther, received the award for careful alterations that they did to this 1940s one-story minimal tradition or frame vernacular residence. This property is one of 10 properties that were allowed to remain as non-contributing residences or resources with the 2009 Old School Square Historic Resource Survey, in effect, they were allowed to opt out of being considered historic. Mr. and Mrs. Luther purchased the property in November of 2019 and have worked very closely with staff and the board to ensure any changes that they made to the property were sensitive to the structure's historic integrity. The board selected 702 Northeast 3rd Avenue in the Delida Park Historic District as the winner of the non-contributing commercial category. Paul Jaquez of QC East Holdings received the award for the successful alteration to convert this 1952 masonry vernacular single family structure to an office. The non-contributing building was previously used as a residence and suffered from unpermitted interior modifications that threatened the structural integrity of the building. Mr. Jaquez purchased the home in September 2019, worked to resolve the code enforcement violations and save the structure. The building was then converted to his office and he relocated his insurance business from another location in Delray Beach to the Delida Park neighborhood and now occupies this structure. The final award was given to 3 Northeast 1st Street, which is where the Delray Beach Historical Society is located for the category of landscape and site improvement project. This property contains the Historical Society archives, museum space, and outdoor areas. This landscape project tells the story of Delray Beach's history of native species and landscaping over the years through a historic garden design. The project has been a great addition to the museum and programming activities as it has allowed visitors to experience history in Delray Beach in an outdoor setting. This proved to be a valuable resource during the COVID-19 pandemic. And I have three more properties. Um, so these are the historic designations. Uh, the, the board recognized the most recent designations to the local register of historic places. The first, again, is 1420 North Swinton Avenue. This went to Blaine Minton. He was recognized for his designation to, of the Clintmore House to the local register. Again, this is a 1928 Georgian colonial style structure. It was placed on the register April 2017. This property's cultural significance began with when Ben Sud Sundy, the di of the Delray Pioneer family, was the first owner of the property. Then Mr. Clint Moore acquired the property in 1929 from Ben Sunday. Most of us know of Clint Moore for Clint Moore Road. Clint Moore was the first person to farm in Delray Beach west of 441, and he was known as the Lima Bean King. The Moore family was active in Delray Beach community, particularly with the Boy Scouts and with St. Paul Episcopal Church. Other families to have owned the property include the Gringle family of the Gringle, Doherty & Wheat real estate firm and the Farrar family. Marjorie served as the director of the DDA during the 90s and early 2000s. Our second designation that was honored, it went to David and Andrea Harden for 516 North Swinton Avenue. This property is known as the Hardin Hart House. 
the 1925 Mediterranean style revival style residence was designated on April 16, 2019. The structure was originally located at 326 Pioneer Place within the city of West Palm Beach, immediately south of what is currently the location of the Northern Art Museum. On Monday, January 24, 1994, the home was detached from its original foundation and floated down the intercoastal waterway to Knowles Park in Delray Beach. The following Monday, hundreds of people gathered and watched a parade of homes as three homes were moved down Swinton Avenue, one the Hardin Hard House, as you see here, and two which are on the CRA property, um, 20 and 18, I think it is, mm -hmm. North Swinton Avenue. And the final property that was honored was 22 North Swinton Avenue. This designation certificate was given to the CRA, Delray Beach CRA, and this property is known as the Wellbrock House. The structure was designated September 10th, 2020. The property currently contains the Monterey House, a circa 1935 Belford Shoemate design, a very important architect from Palm Beach, design structure. This house was also relocated at the same time as the Hardin Hart House in 1994. It was listed on, in 1995 to the local register. In April of 2019, a local developer acquired this 1937 colonial revival style structure from 215 Northeast 7th Avenue. This home was designed by Samuel Ogren, Delray Beach's most prolific architect. The developer planned to redevelop the site with a duplex. Once informed of the proposed demolition, alongside of different activists in the community, the CRA took initiative to preserve this structure by relocating it to their site at 20 North Swinton Avenue. The structure was moved, placed to the rear of the Monterey House in November of 19. The CRA is working on plans to convert the structure to offices. These three property owners have been recognized for their contributions to the longevity of Delray Beach's history. I appreciate the opportunity to share the 2021 HPB Awards presentation with you. This concludes my presentation. Thank you so much. I just want to say, Michelle, I, I so appreciate everything that you, um, you brought to the table here. And it's so great to have the audience that's here to see how the city is um, preserving, we're, we're working towards preserving um, our history as well. And uh, you've you've taken the helm, and uh, uh, you've taken this by the helm. And I, I I'm very proud to be part of the Clint Moore House. That was a situation where they were trying to divide that up into six different uh, parcels and make it into um, just another you know mini um, I guess uh, you know you know uh, uh, yeah I guess I would call it a, like a planned unit development or just mini houses you know in in that area. And it was so great to have the gentleman that came along and bought it to preserve it. And then, of course, the, the Wellbrock House, we were all kind of um, up here part of, most of us anyway. And uh, that was very exciting to watch that house go down the street. And if anybody was here at that time, it was a pretty amazing uh, sight to see. So it's really great to have some of these homes that, are, that mean something to our, from, our view, from our past to um, be able to gift it to the future. So thank you so much. Appreciate thank it. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so moving on, we are now at the comments and inquiries on the agenda uh, for non-agenda and agenda items, um, so long as they're not public, co uh, public um, hearing or uh, quasi-judicial um, items. So at this point in time, what we're gonna do is start with the city manager, if there's any responses to any prior public comments and inquiries, this would be the time. None, Madam Mayor, thank you. Okay, so now we have the open mic to anybody that's in the audience that would like to speak to any issue that is not a quasi-judicial or a public hearing item. You can just come up, state your name and uh, your address, and you will have three minutes. Good Don't afternoon. Start don't start the time until I put my hip and ears. No, we on. won't. We'll, we'll, we'll start it when you get when you start talking. <clears throat> it's probably a three-minute speech, right? No, it's not Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> Pastor H.B. Barr, Jr., Senior Pastor of the Historical St. Paul Ministry, 46 Southwest 10th Avenue in the all-American beautiful city of Derry Beach, Florida. And I have my pen. 
to the, uh, to the mayor, entire commissioner, commission board, to all of you and to all of you in the diocese. I'm not here to insult, call names, find fault, or beauty, or beauty attack the bucket of crabs that endeavored to pull us back under submission with no value. Nor am I here to dilute or de-emphasize the archive plans for progress that have been laid in our files for over 20 years. Nor am I here to ask for the reconstruction or claim to have mastered the defined duties of the current CRA board. I'm here to do what my mother taught me 49 years ago, to say thank you. Thank you when someone does something for you, especially when you can see the benefits and the progress. To the commission, to the mayor, and to the CRA board, thank you for making our neighborhoods to include mostly the west part of Swinton, a part of the entire city progress of Derry Beach. Thank you for allowing us to see visual evidence of improvements that our city so-called needs. We are asking here today that you would keep the current structure of the CRA board, keep the progress, ask that you become a more cohesive team because the Bible that we believe in reminds us togetherness, you can stand. Divided, you will always ultimately fall. I'm not here to attack those who may differ with me or feel different. But I've been home now for 20 years. I see the work. And I want to say thank you. Continue, please, to ensure that all of Derry benefits in your endeavors and in your plans. Not just in one sector, but the entire sector. And not just one financial group, but to all who may not have the funds to stay in other areas. Keep that in mind. Micah tells us that God requires of us love, peace, pursue justice. What has been done so far in the eyes of many of us is justice. Keep it up. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Barr. I am Bertha Wiggum. I am the mother of St. Paul Missionary Baptist Church. I moved to Delray in 1954, and I've been here ever since. My address is 313 Southwest 8th Avenue. I've been at that location since 1962. I celebrated a birthday in May, 94 years young. Bless you. I'm thankful. Happy birthday. I'm thankful to God for every year. And I am too, like the pastor. I would like to see everything keep moving forward. We say that we're all American city. We need to live up to the joints. Step up to the plate. Be what we should be. Do what we can do. Love one another. That's what our Bible says. Love one another as Christ first loved us. I'm not here to preach, but I would like to say, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. There you go. That is the mother St. Paul Missionary Baptist Church, and we love our mother. We, do. we love our mother. 
My name is uh, Reverend Joseph Dawkins, Jr. I serve as the executive pastor of St. Paul Missionary Baptist Church, uh, 46 Southwest 10th Avenue in Delray Beach. I want to do a, a little, little history uh, very, very quickly. Uh, a year ago, uh, in March, uh, we ended services, collective services in our building, and went to 100% virtual to protect our people. Once the pandemic deepened, uh, we began to go out and take food to the seniors, our seniors in the community, again, to protect our people. We were doing groceries once per week. When the pandemic got worse, we went to groceries once a week, a hot meal once a week. When we got out there, we found out that there were a lot of people who were silently hungry. So we tried to address the needs of those people. So we partnered with another company and we got these big boxes that hold three days worth of food. So we were doing the, uh, the hot meals once a week, small groceries once a week, and then that box for three days once per week. When the pandemic got worse, we didn't step back, we stepped up. What we did was we didn't stop, we didn't put on our mask, put on our aprons, we went out there anyway because we wanted to protect our people. When those items became hard to get, like toilet paper and paper towels and those kinds of things, we collected them in the church, kept them there, and we told our people, look, don't go to the stores. Call us, and we'll bring it to you again to protect our people. When the vaccine became available in January, a lot of our people did not have Internet access. So what we did was we created phone banks, call the church, and then we'll, we'll, we will do the legwork to get you on a list. That didn't work. Didn't work for a lot of our people. So what we did was we started to have vaccines at the church. Six separate times, our church has opened its doors and its property so people can get vaccinated. Again, to protect our people. What does it have to do with this? Our people value, they place value on those who protect them. Commissioner Casale, thank you so much. You walked up and down that sidewalk with us in the heat of the day, compelling people to get their vaccinations. She was right out there with us. Thank you so much. We value you because you were out there with us protecting our people. I said all that to say this. People who do a lot of things for us, and don't protect our people, have no value to us. Right now, the current makeup of the CRA is valuable to us because, like Mother said, it's protecting our people. My time is up. Let's Reverend, Reverend Dawkins, if you have six people in the audience that are not interested in speaking, they can allow you another three or a few more minutes if you need it. Okay. okay just don't, don't okay. come up to speak. Okay. Right? So if, okay. if you give me six hands... They're not going to speak. One, two, three. Just remember, okay. okay. A couple of you got it. Okay. Thank you. And, and, and I, I'm, I'll be very, very quick. But the thing, all of you, every single one of you, you campaign, camp, you campaign to our people mm -hmm. on inclusion, being inclusive of whatever it is that you're going to do. You said to us that we will get that proverbial, if you would, seat at the table to remove the current uh, linkages to our neighborhood. You're not only removing the seat, but you're removing the table as well. Okay? So our point is this, is that if there is a, and, I, and I'm, I'm going to say this as clear as I can, if you promised us that you will be linked to us, that there will be linkages to us, if you allow a private promise to trump, no pun intended, or to supersede a public promise to us, then to us, you've made yourself, you devalued yourself to us. You have no value to us. The promise that you made to keep the linkages there so that our community will have some say-so in what's going on, that promise we expect you to keep. We expect you to keep it. So that's all that I have, and I'm hoping that you will keep your promise. Don't be bashful, just come on up. I'm going to read something. My name is LaToya Boone, address 507 Southwest 15th Avenue, Delray Beach, Florida. I'm a proud resident here. 
I sent out an email to the CRA board and I just wanted to read it. It said, good evening, commissioners. I am Latoya Boone and would like to know where this new idea to, to not have a voice from our community involved on the CRA board. For the past couple of years since the oversight of the commission, so much has been done in surrounding communities that we have never seen before. Why would you look for a change to what is actually a functioning, working organization? I know when the last electoral race was taking place, this was a subject highlighted by the losing opponent and two other candidates that actually kept their seats. I'm appalled at the new debate or even discussion that will be voted on without the community's opinion or comment for review. For a long time, the community finally saw things getting done in our communities, and now you want to reverse? For whose benefit? Please remember, our votes and voices count and should be heard. This should not be a final acknowledgement from the dais without careful consideration of who it will affect. We the people want to know, can you show where this is beneficial or a detriment? Please, let's table this or clear it for a concise answer before you actually vote. And I ask the entire commission that because we all in this community have a voice and we would like to always have that voice to be heard and not taken away from. So I thank the commission for listening to Latoya Boone. Thank you very much. Yvonne Odom, 3905 Lawson Boulevard, Mayor and Commissioner. Today's comments are not necessarily directed at you, but to the citizens of Delray Beach. I've lived here, like many of you, through racism, experienced racism, observed racism, fought it, witnessed it, all in my lifetime. But this is not an example of racism. Don't get caught up in the wolves crying wolf. You have a hybrid model that was created in the beginning for the sole reason of political payback. It was not for representation. Take us back to the seven member board that had four African American men who grew up in this city, who was born in this city. That commission was the one that was dismantled. And then the CRA, was taken over by the city commission. I didn't like it then. I don't necessarily like it now. But one thing I did say, if you're going to take it over, take it over. Why are you making two extra seats just to put somebody on there to say you have representation? That is not representation. At the end of a marathon commission meeting, where was the apology to those seven members that were taken off without notice. Their feelings were hurt. They were an award-winning CRA board. There was, where was the public outrage then? Now here we are, because some of you see that that hybrid model does not work. I have witnessed the meetings. I don't miss very many meetings. The ones that I could not come to, I listen online. It does not work when you have two extra people that come in and with these five. Just listen at it sometimes. Sometimes the names get confused. They don't know if it's the CRA. They don't know if it's the commission. And at this time, take that and just look for yourself. You observe it. Don't get caught up on something that's being touted as racism, and it's not. I've lived through racism. You've lived through it, and you know what it looked like. So don't get caught up on this particular situation, which has nothing to do with racism. The elimination of those two seats will no way affect our representation. Yes, I want to go back to the independent CRA board, and yes, I want you to keep looking. But at this point, let the commissions run it. If they want to run it, let them run it. So I fully support the five-member board with continued effort to return us to the independent board. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes, ma'am. Good evening, everybody. 
Uh, my name is Pamela Brinson, former CRA commissioner. Um, I, I pondered for almost a week about what I was going to say and, and, and the presentation and everything, so I'm just going to speak from the heart. First of all, we as, we as a people, everybody, Delray, this whole city, we have two things in common. We want our children to grow up. In a, in a town where we all get along. We want our children to do well. We want our children to go to college. We want what's best for our, our family. But this is the thing that we have to build on. All this nonsense about racial and this and that, I'm not feeling it. It's about what's right and wrong, okay? Um, there are people that look like me that stand to gain based on division, keeping division within the community, okay? So my thing is, I'm going to give you an analogy. Uh, it may seem corny, but here it is. One of my favorite shows is Little House on the Perry. Um, when one person got in trouble, the whole town came to the rescue. No matter what happened, they were there. And we're going to always have the Miss Olsons of Walnut Grove, okay? The, the negative and the naysayers and the ones that, you know, see things their way. But what is it accomplishing? Nothing. So at what point are we going to stand together and be one? Mm -hmm. And this is my question. Um, by eliminating this, I think we've done a lot of work. And you're not the only one. The, the seven-man war was not the only one that was blindsided. I was also not put back on the board too, for other reasons, we won't get into that. But it's the same thing. But I kept it in stride. I'm not holding it against anybody. We keep it moving. I wanna help those who want, who wanna be helped, who appreciate it. So that's my thing. I think the two should remain on the CRA board. Pamela, can you give us, Pam, Pam, Ms. Brinson, can you give us your address please? I don't know that you mentioned that. 406 Southwest 15 Terrace. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Yes, sir. Anyone else? Andrea Kaiser, Kaiser Legal, 55 Southeast 2nd Avenue, Delray Beach, Florida, 33444. Just want to say it's very difficult to follow such inspirational speakers and leaders here on a very important subject. I'm sorry to bore you. Mine's not that important, <laughs> but here I am. I'm here speaking on behalf of Opportunities located um, north of Lake Ida on Federal Highway. Last August 2020, Opportunities submitted a text amendment application uh, with the intent to create a new conditional use category to create an outdoor use area for standalone bars. That application was put on hold because the city commission so graciously in an effort to support small business owners granted the temporary outdoor use for standalone bars, which is set to expire this September. We don't know if the city will um, renew or extend that temporary use, but um, we do know that Opportunities has seen a 36% increase in sales and that a majority of their patrons prefer to be outdoors than indoors. So we wanted to work towards a more permanent solution. We'd like to continue moving our application forward, but we may not do that unless the code of ordinances is amended, um, the alcoholic uh, beverage portion of the code is amended, and that cannot be applicant initiated. Um, it has to be at the direction of the city commission to staff. So I'm here to respectfully request that we be able to move forward with our application um, so long as staff can present an amendment to you for your review and consideration of that section. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Sir. Yes. Good evening. Uh, Madam Mayor and Commissioners and uh, ladies and gentlemen of our audience today. I'm Pastor Johnson of uh, Mount Olive Baptist Church, 40 Northwest 4th Avenue, Delray Beach. Uh, I have served at Mount Olive for now what is almost 38 years of being in Delray. Um, I want to say that uh, we've already had a great sermon. And I want to thank Pastor Bob for those inspiring words that were given to us. But let me say uh, this, and I did not come to just speak on an issue, but I recall a great and, and powerful uh, 
minister who was a mentor in my life, Dr. Gardner C. Taylor, who said on one occasion, he said, never get up and speak on a rumor. Because most of the time when you get up and speak about a rumor, uh, the rumor was really not a rumor until you spoke on it. <laughs> that there's a lot of times that it is not uh, a rumor until it gets out. I don't know anything about whether or not there's been a definite rumor as to whether there's going to be changes in the CRA. But let me say that I spoke years ago to the commission here. Many of you were not on that commission, and I've seen many commissioners change. I've seen many mayors come and go. Uh, and uh, I believe my business that God placed me in Delray was to work with the church and do whatever I can to help to make sure that the city, amen, is a city that the people can be peacefully, you know, enjoyable and live again. And this is what I've pledged myself to do over the years. I don't just pass the Mount Olive, but I pass the people. And that is people that are in Delray West Side, Delray East Side. I'll go over on the beach if I need to, and I've done that before as well. And I believe in my doing that, I saved a lot of young people's lives. But I said this to our commission before. Until we start seeing more equality, in positions and, and in seats. I'm not trying to say that you don't qualify, but I'm saying that equality will meet the needs of, of the broad sense of the community if they have representation. Years ago, one of our former mayors said to me, well, Pastor, what do you think we need to do when they were looking for a police chief? And they said to me, uh, do you think that we need a, a black police chief? And I said to him, what's wrong with having a black police chief? I said, maybe if we had a black police chief, we'd probably have more people of color graduating from school in criminal justice and wanting to be on the police force. Mm -hmm. And look at what has happened. Praise God Almighty. <laughs> we have a black police chief, and he's not just looking at our community, but he's looking at the city. And look how uniform and, and how beautiful our police department looks. And, and it's showing the consistency of the city. So I'm saying this because in all of my 37 or 38 years of being here, I've never seen the things that I see now happening on the west side of Delray. I mean the development, that I'm looking at now is something that's great and grand. Even just the drive from my church on the way, going home and go down Atlantic, and, and even as late as seeing a project out there that's recognizing a young man who was taken from this world uh, by one of the saddest occasions that it could be, but he dedicated his young life helping elderly people in their homes and stuff, you know? And now our city is remembering that. And they're putting up a development in the name of Corey Jones. I think that's just wonderful. I thank all of you for that. Thank you. But ladies and gentlemen, listen, I agree with one lady that spoke today in her beautiful heart. If it's not broken, don't fix it. I told my wife that about 30 years ago. And I celebrated this year 51 years of marriage because right. I told her, if it's not broken, don't fix it. So this is all I have to say. God bless you. Thank you, Pastor. Yes, ma'am. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Angie Gray, 3765 Riverside Way, Delray Beach. And to the mayor and the commission, thank you so much. I'd just like to say that um, if it's not broke, don't fix it. But... I would like to say that it has been just a great pleasure to work with you all on the board, on the CRA board. I am one of the appointees that is up for a vote this evening to rather get rid of me, Kelsey Brooks, and well, thank you so much, Pella Brinson, for serving. Um, but we have done some amazing work, and i just like to stay on the board to continue to do the work that we've done for over 41 years. Um, we have made a promise to the Northwest, Southwest, Osceola Park. We are now have over 80 
uh, percent of our dollars now going to these areas. If you look around, if you were honest about it, you could see sidewalks, alleyways, affordable housing, economic development, small business helps, grant dollars, and we just have so much more work to do. Pompey Park um, was on hold, and thank you, Commissioner Johnson, for um, bringing that back up and making sure that you get a report for that. And um, so I just like to say thank you also to everyone that came out because we do see the work. We see the work underground and we see the work above grounds. The CRA has been successful in the past with definitely buying up all of our lots and all of our properties, but they were certainly not successful in making sure that they replaced them so that we can now have small businesses. So I want to thank you and thank everyone for coming out and we hope that you will all do the right thing tonight and that is to move forward with continuing the board with the structure that we have today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner. Hi. Good afternoon. My name is Sheila Townsend, 200 Northwest Fifth Avenue, Unit C. And I am coming here today in order to offer my support for the current format of the commission. Um, I am a resident here now for four years, and I have been actually able to see the work that you are doing um, with the infrastructure, basic infrastructure that was not present on the west side of Swinton, you can now see sidewalks in 2021, alleys, but those same issues do not exist on the east side of Swinton. I'm on the northwest side and I understand that there is a proposal for projects on our side. I cannot walk on both sides of my street on a sidewalk. I have to walk on a street. I am here again to support the commission to say I would like for you to retain the two representatives, the community representatives, so our voices can continue to be heard and so that I can have a sidewalk. <laughs> so that I can have street lights on my street. I do not have street lights in 2021. Does that exist on the east side of Swinton? The answer is no. So for us to have to come for, again, basic infrastructure in 2021, I say I can see what you're doing and please continue with the current format, the representatives who currently sit on the board who allow our concerns to be heard. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Townsend. Anyone else? Seeing no one, I'm going to close the comments first. Public comments are closed. Thank you all so much for um, your comments. Um, we are going to be discussing this issue as our first item, so hang tight. We're at the consent agenda um, portion of our agenda, so. If anybody would like to make a motion to approve, um, make sure that you include that it's been changed. As motion amended. to approve the consent agenda as amended. Second. Call the roll, please. Mr. Boylston. Yes. Ms. Johnson. Yes. Mayor Petrolia. Yes. Mr. Frankel. Yes. Ms. Cassell. Yes. Okay, moving on to what was once 7D, I believe. E. E. I'm sorry, E. We are going to move. We're, we're going to be talking about that as resolution number 101-21. Ms. Jellen. So pursuant to the direction of the commission at our last meeting, I prepared resolution 101-21, which reaffirms the city commission as a CRA, which would establish a CRA as a five-member board, um, which be, would be comprised of the five of you. It would, be, it would terminate the terms of the two appointed members that are currently serving on the CRA. It would appoint the vice mayor of the city of Delray Beach as the chair of the CRA and the deputy vice mayor of the city of Delray Beach as the vice chair. And it would repeal all prior resolutions and conflicts herewith. Very good. To the commission. Well, I would like to start. Sure. Um, being that I brought, up, I brought up this discussion and I appreciate everyone everyone coming out tonight and I just want to give you a, a little background on how this conversation how this conversation started um, as many of you know I wanted to go back to an independent board we talk about having a seat at a table 
I wanted to give you the whole table, all the chairs, literally my chair too. Um, I wanted to go back to an independent board. After the election, I sat down with our, our city attorney and I learned that we couldn't go back to an independent board. I didn't know that. I think that was a surprise to her as well. Um, three cities have, I think I believe it's three cities have challenged it um, and were unsuccessful. Is that accurate? I'm not aware of who challenged it. They sought um, attorney general opinions oh, okay. and the opinions confirmed the fact that you are not able to, once the commission um, power, so to speak, is transferred mm -hmm. to the city commission from, from the CRA, you can't go back to an independent board. So once, once I learned that, um, I was looking for any way that we could be even a better CRA. I obviously don't think that we are a, a CRA that aren't getting things done. I'm on that CRA. I think we're very successful. And in this past March, I went around and gave you a list of all the things that we've been a part of many times in your mailbox. That isn't the reason. Also, it hurts me, Ms. Gray, that you've posted on Facebook, they want to get rid of us because we are helping the black community. That hurts. That hurts if that's what you think. If we could go back to an independent board, I wouldn't be on the CRA board anymore, and most likely you'd be the chair of it. And Mr. Brooks would probably be the co-chair of that board, and you would be running that board. And what would be really great about that is that I could meet with you and it wouldn't be a sunshine law violation. I could even get more input from you. Now, I've been trying to have coffee with you for two years to, to, no, I'm sorry to, you can't. I'm to, sorry. Work at, to work on our relationship and you won't take me up on that and that's okay. Um, but to post something like this for a few of my, or one of my colleagues to post online that this is about taking the, the, the black voice away, um, is ridiculous because I wanted to give my seat up. I wanted to go back to an independent board. So when I sit down with our city attorney and our city manager and I look at where there's opportunities to even be a better board, well, a five-person board with three of those individuals being reelected with 80%, 80% of the Northwest-Southwest vote, that's Ms. Johnson, Mr. Frankel, and myself, 80% of the vote in the Northwest-Southwest. So to be a five-person board, I thought I could get more done. Now, the second I found out that there was any other type of narrative out there or that we hadn't had enough of a conversation about this impactful move, I pulled my support. I contacted our city, our city attorney, correct, Ms. Jellen, and I pulled my support for this to even be a discussion tonight, immediately. Called her on the phone, said, you can pull it. I, I'm, not, I'm not voting on this. I'm not moving forward with this. Um, so I just, I just want to set the record straight and this narrative out there on Facebook and in comments and in posts, it's destructive to our community. It separates our community. There is not one example I can find in the state where a CRA has a hybrid model. Matter of fact, I can't find a city, county, or state board that has a hybrid model because there's issues that come with that. There's issues with having elected officials and then having public appointees on the board. There, there are issues, but that's okay. If there are colleagues of mine that think the pros outweigh the cons, well, that's great. Then, I, then I'm in favor and, and we can move forward as the successful CRA board we are, but don't let this get twisted and, and politicized. I voted against taking over the independent CRA board. I voted against taking those seven people off in Ms. Odom, you're right. We never said sorry. They were taken off at the, the, the 12th hour, the 11th hour. And so I, I would like to publicly apologize, even though I didn't vote to that, publicly apologize for those seven individuals who are putting in a lot of work at the CRA to just be removed from that board. Never notified ahead of time. Never give them a chance like you had an opportunity tonight to make comments. They were removed from that board even after all the work that they had done. I fought against the removal of the West Atlantic Redevelopment Coalition from our city process. Work. Work used to be part of our city decisions, officially part of our city decisions. I fought against removing them. They were removed. They were removed from the conversation. I fought for three years to adopt the update to the West Atlantic Redevelopment Plan. I couldn't get it passed and adopted on the CRA board. Didn't have the votes. After three years of fighting and bringing up six times, we finally got it adopted. And I introduced the, um, the, 
the concept of taking CRA funds and putting it towards race equity workshops after I personally attended it with my wife and it changed my life. Uh, we want to work together. I don't want to have any reason to have to have a meeting like this again where the community feels like you have to come out and a decision is going to be made without your input. It's, it, that's, that's not going to happen. That's not the way Delray does things. So I want to set the record straight tonight. I've pulled my support for this item. I don't even think it should be on the agenda. I shouldn't, that your evening shouldn't have been wa wasted being here. Um, and I will be voting against it and keeping the CRA board just the way it is. Thank you. Thank you. I, I want to slip in here real quick before I'm going to recognize the vice mayor. Um, you know, first of all, I want to say to this audience, thank you very much for bringing a positive message to this commission. Not the message that you just heard, but a positive message did not come in here and denigrate or t tear down any one of us who asked for what was right to happen tonight. That's all you were asking for. And this isn't about racism. This isn't a racist situation. This is about where the money is going in our city and where it hasn't gone. That's really what it's about. And I'm sorry for the previous CRA board, but I sat up here, Commissioner Boylston. You were not here for years and years and years, as the mayor struggled to get the CRA board to get straight with where the money should be going. We made the promise for 30 years and why it still wasn't being delivered. Every year, we, we had the plan. I'm telling you, people are gonna tell you, the plan was there. I agree with that. It's just that we never put the plan in action. Because that plan was there for many, many years, before even the previous CRA. Problem was, is getting that rubber on the road. And that's what you've seen as a difference with this current commission. And I take offense to anybody pointing out to anybody and asking them to be held accountable when all they have been doing is being held accountable. The, Commissioner Gray, you have brought so much to the CRA board. I don't want to see it operate without you. You are an absolute you know, person in the community that delivers the information that we need to know what to do. And I appreciate that in you. Thank you for that. So I sit here and tell you, it is a better CRA. Why? Because you can drive through your, ta your, your streets, and I can too, and you can see a difference. In the last three years, there has been a difference. And that's not because we've taken it over or that somebody was left behind. It's because as a group, and I include everybody up here, we made the conscious decision, inclusive of the two additional members of our board, to put that money where it was supposed to be and where it belongs. And we've been doing that, and we're going to continue to do it. And by the way, I don't want to do it without the extra two, two community members. And I don't care how everybody else does it. I'm going to be honest with you. We're doing it. We're getting it done right. And until it breaks down, there's no reason to fix it. <laughs> I'm going to recognize the vice mayor. I was going to say, are you going to leave me any thunder nope, here? No, nope, you got it. <laughs> okay. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for coming out. Um, I live in the Northwest section, and I tell you, I am so ecstatic about the things that we've done for the past three years. I sat for an entire year watching the interactions of the independent CRA and um, its communication with the city commission, and it was just one battle after the other always at odds. So at 2.30 in the morning before the election, I proposed that we dissolve it. Uh, didn't see that we needed to give any forewarning because as the city commissioners appointed them, it's by right that they can be dissolved. So there was, um, I don't know that there's any particular process for saying we're about to dissolve you, but anyway, that's history. What I'd like to talk about um, again, thank you so much for coming. A few weeks ago, we discussed how we could get more publicity uh, for the good works of our CRA. And I'd like to thank Commissioner Bolston, who figured out a way, because once you propose changing the composition, the citizens 
took notice. Wherein before we've been doing things and no one, no one ever came to me anyway and said, thank you for that alley. Thank you for that uh, sidewalk. So that was a very clever way of doing that. I'd like to commend you for it. I uh, don't know if it quite turned out the way we had thought it would, but uh, I took the positive side of it. Um, not all of the publicity is in a positive, has been in a positive manner, but as our former president said, all publicity is good publicity because we're out there. And uh, that's all I'll say about that. Um, apparently, uh, more people appreciate what has been happening in the past three years than I have heard um, opposed to it. Um, and we are a hybrid agency, and I thought once I Googled it uh, yesterday that there were others. I'm, I'm not going to even get into it. Uh, I think that um, having two volunteers who have other time that I don't always have to know everything that's going uh, on in the community. Unfortunately, the citizens in Delray, I don't know about the other cities, will suffer before they will come and stand at that podium for three minutes to tell the commissioners, CRA commissioners or the city commissioners, we've got a problem. I have some who will call me and I'm appreciative of that and I try to direct them in the right direction. I appreciate any citizen who feels the power to come before your government and say, I got a problem and I want you to fix it. And you don't always have to come through me, not that I don't mind it. You have, the structure is rather that the city manager, in this particular case, our interim city uh, manager, is responsible for operating the city. So if you have a problem, you're supposed to go to the uh, interim city manager and uh, bring your situation to her, and I guarantee you uh, she's going to solve it, or you're going to then come step it up and then come to the city commission. But if you want to reverse it, that's acceptable too. If you feel more comfortable coming to one of us, feel free. I'm never going to hopefully turn you away. I may not get to you as quickly as you'd like. If it's an emergency, please go to her because she can fix it a heck of a lot faster than I will ever be able to. Um, Five elected officials supplemented by two volunteers from the community, Northwest Set, Northwest Southwest. A lot of you know how difficult it is for me to say set, but I'm working on it. Um, volunteer members who give their times free of charge. We don't compensate them. So that means you must love what you're doing. You love your community, and I'm appreciative of it. And I don't know that we ever thanked Mrs. Miss Brinson for her dedication for two years. It is not easy attending the meetings, being aware of what's going on, studying so that you can make the right decision for the community and not just for the CRA because when you make a decision for the CRA, you're also making a decision for the city of Delray Beach. We have eight districts that are designated um, uh, community redevelopment um, districts that are in an order or in a state of slum and blight that it was accepted by the county and the state as being a part of a CRA. A lot of cities don't have that many, and I don't know if that's a blessing or not, but the more districts we have contributing to it, everyone in the city does not pay into the uh, CRA's coffers. So those of you who are affected and pay that extra tax, I commend you for not complaining about that because that would be something that most people don't like paying taxes. And I don't even know if you realize you're paying extra if you live in the CRA district. Therefore, you should have a voice. And I encourage you to come to our meetings and appreciate the, the difficulty that exists sometimes in making a decision. We don't have a lot of money, but what we have, we should be uh, using it wisely. Um, after, and I had hoped that the executive director was going to be able to make a presentation, but I guess most of you know what's going on. I heard you talk about the sidewalks, the alleys. I've got one near me. I'm so happy. And eventually there's going to be a sidewalk one day. Maybe I won't be up here at, when it comes, but I'm looking forward to it. I propose that we continue as we are presently composed. However, I would like to suggest one item, uh, my fellow commissioners, 
and uh, mayor, mm -hmm. that we reform and bring back the CRA advisory board, that the eight districts have a representative and that three others are added, making an 11 member board to provide a pool from which to draw our future two volunteers because I know that they have other things that they'd like to do in their lives besides the dedication that they have. And they can always come and make presentations, but uh, I'm sure after four years and two years for the other two commissioners, they might just like to do a few other things with their time or not. I'd like consensus from the commission to direct our city attorney or whoever, whatever the process is, to reconstitute that advisory board and bring it before us at another time. Do we have an advisory board that was like that? I, that would be different than what we've had, right? Because this would actually be a, a member per district? It would almost be like a committee. Okay. I, mean, I wouldn't want to call it a board because it gives the wrong connotation. So do you want to get, I mean, do you have, con do you have consensus to just look into the idea of having an advisory board? So can you look into that and how it would work? That would be great. Thank you for that thank suggestion. You. Anything else? And thank you very much. And uh, I appreciate all of you. Uh, please continue to take notice of the wonderful things our CRA is doing and spread the word. We are working. Thank you. Mayor, sure. be Mayor before anyone leaves, can you just correct the record in regards to the CRA taxes? Yeah, um, there, uh, as far as I'm, uh, I'm aware, there is no additional taxes in the CRA district. Here's how it works. The CRA district taxes stay in that district and all the money is spent in that district. So it doesn't go to the city to spend elsewhere. So that's how the tax district works. And the more important part of the CRA taxing district is that the money that would normally go to the county, because there's a certain portion of money that we take out of our city and give to the county, we don't have to take that out and give it to the county. We get to keep that and retain it in the CRE district, which allows us to do a lot more in the district because it's giving us money and the city is still working to uh, keep the, the, the uh, uh, infrastructure going. So it gives us that extra boost of money in that particular district. So that's how it works. It's not that you've got an additional amount of money, uh, uh, taxes. It's that basically it's staying in the district. That's how it works. Thank you for the correction. Um, sure thing. Com Commissioner Casal. Thank you. Um, so thank you all for coming. And to the pastors, thank you so much for your thoughtful words. Um, Ms. Boone, I just want to say, because you asked us to answer the question, I was opposed to this immediately when the discussion occurred, and uh, still am. Um, I think it's a learning experience for us. When I campaigned, this was issue and we were being asked repeatedly would we give the CRA back to the residents an intelligent gentleman said to me if you don't know say no and I said no um, and I guess my point is perhaps because this was an issue for two years before saying to people we would do this or I didn't but I'm speaking Ryan to you maybe um, we should have had this discussion with the attorneys because now here we are and um, I, I, what I want to say to you is in defense, defense of Ms. Gray, because I do appreciate your contribution. And I know I sat on a board as a volunteer. It's a significant time commitment, and I thank you for that, and uh, Mr. Brooks as well. But when we were at the meeting the other night, Ryan, you indicated that the CRA staff was in agreement with the idea of going back to five. And I have to tell you, I, I reached out to the staff because I do weigh what they say pretty heavily. And my understanding is that was not accurate. And for that to have been said was very hurtful to their feelings. Can you imagine her serving as a volunteer and then thinking that the staff is behind her back not wanting their, her there or thinking she's qualified or whatever? It, it's the whole conversation shouldn't have happened you should have figured out before you made that promise if you could do it. And you know, when you can't, maybe you have to just say to people, sorry, I can't do it. But to say that she, the staff agreed about looking to change back to five, I, that's, that wasn't accurate. It, 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 I'm sorry that was said. It, it was, and it's no reflection on the individual. None of this is a reflection I, it's, on the It wasn't said. Yeah, it, I'm sorry. It was, I'm sorry. I met with, I met with staff, so 
I do and, and, you and you really want me about, to call you out right here? And we talked about the Excuse pros. me, I Renee, I am really sorry to do this to you right don't now. Don't do it to her. May I ask yeah, that it, we it, now it, table? No, Ryan, I'm not you're not going to say I'm okay, guys, not telling the truth. Um, one me, at a time and I don't know. Let me just be really clear when I when I met with the CRA, we talked about the pros. There are there, there are pros that we can literally Ryan, have a meeting. Ryan, you should just apologize for making that statement. I just opened the door for you. Just walk through it. No. Okay, thank you. I, I've met, I've met with staff Renee. I won't put you on the spot, but you know that I called you and we had that conversation. Okay, and thank and, you. and I want to clear up I'm one sorry. other. And I want to clear up one other thing, just so that there is no misunderstanding here. Um, when when we were talking about taking over the CRA board, okay, there was a period of time where the previous mayor, Mayor Glickstein, had several conversations with that previous board trying to get them in lockstep to get that money into the areas that were that money was supposed to go to and inevitably it just wasn't going so that happened before when i became mayor and uh vice mayor uh, johnson uh, led the charge of taking over the cra deputy vice uh, mayor um, uh, adam frankel asked specifically the city attorney and that is not the same city attorney Attorney, it was Mr. Lohman. Can we return it back? He not only said it once, I think he said it three times. Yes, you have the right to return it back. Yes, you can return it back if you choose to do so as a board. That was told to us three times. Now, there is a reason that that gentleman is no longer there, because that wasn't the first time that he was flying from the hip telling us something that was not in fact, the truth. And once we made that decision, we as a body had no idea we could not go back until just after this last election when our city attorney, the current city attorney, investigated and found out once you go across that, that line, you cannot return back. That was the point at which all of us was made aware. And I know there's a lot of people out on Facebook as well that are accusing me that I knew this. Absolutely, I didn't know it. Our city attorney, Mr. Lohman, who was up here before, told us, absolutely, you can return it. So I just want to make that clear because there were persons on this board that would not have gone in that direction, one being to my right. And I made a promise to this gentleman also that I would return it at a later date. And I gave him my word, but unfortunately, we can't. So we move on. That's what happened. Go ahead. May, may I? Uh, well, actually, I need to. You want to say yes, something? Yes, yes. Okay. Go right ahead. I appreciate it because I appreciate you bringing that up. I'm not so sure we can't, and I'll tell you why I'm not so sure we can't, because in my opinion, in my conversation with our city attorney, she may feel differently, but I think it's enough to ask for an attorney general opinion. Um, as Mr. Uh, Boylston said earlier, we kind of went from a seven-person independent board to a hybrid, a five elected official, two independent. And uh, uh, Ms. Odom, I see you looking at me. <laughs> <laughs> I always said, if we're going to do it, we're going to do a temporary thing. I, I thought just we needed to clean things up. I think we've done a good job at that. However, the attorney general opinions, and Lynn, please correct me if I'm wrong, they went from purely independent to purely run by a governmental body, city commission. It, it didn't specifically say independent, but it did talk about the commission was a part of the board. Right. So it didn't say it was completely independent, but it also didn't reference that there were two additional people. Or, um, and remember, the, the the CRA board can be comprised of up to two additional people. So it's your city commission plus two additional. So it didn't specifically reference one way or the other what it was. So, I mean, did it say that these were hybrid boards? No. I'm happy to get an opinion if that's the consensus of the commission, to see if that's still something that you wish to pursue. I do not wish to pursue that. I think we should keep it as it is right now. And... May I make a motion that we table this discussion because it's getting to be rather lengthy, and uh, I think more research should... I'll second it, but I'd like to continue my comments, if that's okay. Go right ahead. Thank you. Um, I want to be clear. I live in the CRA district, and I work in the CRA district. I may be the only member of the board that can say that. I'm not sure. Well, I live there. He works there. But you're retired. <laughs> you're I, lucky. I'm, I live there. I didn't say I work there. Uh, he, so he works I, there. And I do think, one... The, the bringing on of our executive director who assembled an amazing team was probably the highlight of the last few years. Renee and her, her team uh, do the job. 
we're up there, you know, we give our opinions, but day to day, they, they do an amazing job. So it's, Renee should be getting the, the applause, not us. Yeah. Let me be very clear about that. And I also heard some of the representatives uh, that came up for public comment tonight talking about they want their voices heard. I think it's very important to tell you, and you can tell uh, your neighbors and whatnot, we established a couple years ago a Northwest Southwest Advisory Board, and we really don't have any applicants for that. I, I know Mr. Boylston brought it up at the last meeting. Let's get that board constituted. We want to hear from you. We want issues to go uh, uh, to a governing body that's bound by the sunshine law. So anyone who's here today, go online or go see our city clerk. Let, let's get that board going because that has sat vacant for a couple years, and certainly that's a great way to have your voices heard. So. Uh, I, I joined the vice mayor in her motion to table this, but I'd also like to see a request uh, to our city attorney to find out what our options are. Because uh, when you make decisions, it's always, as the mayor said just right before me, it's always important to have all your options on the table before you make decisions. So I'd like to see it like that. And I appreciate everyone coming out in the rain and this, this nasty weather today to, to let us hear your voices. We do appreciate that. Thank you. So I'm, uh, I've got a motion and a, and a, a second on the table with respect to um, tabling. And I don't want to table it because I don't want you guys to come back out here. So I'm going <laughs> to deny the tabling of this uh, motion. And I think that we just need to get down to business and yeah, we make a decision the, tonight. We vote on the table. Yeah. I think I think I think the commission can vote on on deferring the matter. No, I know. I, I'm gonna. I, that, that's why I'm making the statement because I want my fellow the, the the constituency to understand what is on the the plate here, and that is to table this to another date. And I'm just telling you, we just went through it. There is no reason, from my perspective, to table anything. Um, so we have a motion and a second. Please call the roll. I'm sorry. If oh, I go ahead. Clarification from Ms. Jellin. In tabling, it means deferring it to uncertain date, right? No. Correct. So there would be no action taken on the resolution. Typically, you can approve a resolution, deny, you know, deny a resolution. You can table it to a date certain. You can table it to a date uncertain. So those are those are the options that you have today. Can we table it until we can talk more about advisory? Everyone knows that it's going to remain the same. It's going to remain as it is. That's what we need to vote on then tonight. Well, it's because not there's no reason to bring it back. We can bring back. We can actually have a workshop on whatever it is that you find out. But we should, we should deal with what is on the agenda tonight because otherwise you're leaving everybody in limbo. How is that if we're not going to change commission, the commission? So deferring it means you're not taking any action. Right. So you're basically going to put it off to another date when the commission decides you want to rehear this and reconsider this matter. Either you need additional the changing information from, five, five, or five, like from seven to five. May I make a motion to deny? There's no. a motion. Well, no. let's, There's I think we should vote on the motion to yeah. defer, and then and then we can see what happens with that and make other motions. Okay, so there's a, a motion to table this. Um, call the roll, please. Ms. Johnson. Yes. Mayor Petrolia. No. Mr. Frankel. Yes. Ms. Cassell. No. Mr. Bolston. No. Okay. So motion you want to do another? Deny resolution number 101-21. Second. Call the roll, please. Mayor Petrolia? Yes. Mr. Frankel? Yes. Ms. Cassell? Yes. Mr. Bolston? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Okay. We have denied it. It's not, it's not been tabled. So we are all set uh, to go if you guys want to. There's no more discussion on this particular matter. So I'm going to give you a couple minutes to head out the door if anybody wants to, to leave. Thank you all so much for coming out. Thank you. And stay, Thank you. stay safe and stay dry. Yes. But we need the rain. And may I put in a plug for vac vaccinations? <laughs> right. Do that. Good to see you. Get your vaccination.
I'm sorry. I apologize. I feel bad for Renee. I texted her. All right, that cleared out the entire room. <laughs> So we get down to business. Here Mayor, we go. Just two housekeeping matters. Yes. One, do you want staff look at, to look into an advisory committee for the CRA? Is there a consensus we for that? that? Yeah, we have. Or do you want to? On wanna, top of the Northwest, Southwest that we already have. Well, the problem is, is that that's a different, sh what was what was presented was a different idea, which was to the take one person out of each district and have a representation. Uh, which I think is a, is a great idea. That way you're not like focused on just one area. Absolutely. In the Okay, so there's yeah. consensus for that? I think we had the consensus. And, and the additional three could be um, at, at large. large. We, we can talk about the composition. Let me just do some more research and I'll, we can get back to you on that. And then what about the Attorney General opinion? Is that something that the Commission desires? No? No? I, I mean, I, I think only for the public's, pur public's purpose. You know, all, the public is questioning whether or not that's accurate information. And I'm biased, but I think it's accurate. But I'm happy to look into it for you. Yeah, I, I, I think you've put enough time into it from my yeah. perspective. I don't really care. And I think that it's actually working. So there's just. I mean, anybody can ask for it, to be honest with you. So, I mean, it doesn't. I'm seeking direction because I want to make sure that's the will of the commission. It doesn't hurt. It doesn't change anything. I do think, though, that once that, that proverbial power is transferred from the independent board to the commission, whether or not it's hybrid or not, I think, I think you just lost that opportunity. And it's unfortunate that you didn't have that information before you. It's unfortunate that an opinion wasn't sought at that point to make sure that it was valid. I, I don't think it changes things. I, I think you know, good information is good for everybody. And in the future, right. if we, there's five different people sitting up here and they want to do the same thing, at least we have an opinion specific to Delray as to whether or not it's appropriate. So it's, it's not a lot of time. It's just basically an email. I think, the, it's, a, I think it's a good idea. I think you got your consensus. Okay. Um, okay, so moving on to 7BB, which was 6D, taken from the uh, consent agenda, and I removed that. That was the extending the lease agreement for the terms of the lease of the Gleason Street parking um, a lot. And I have a question for you. If, if Missy, are you the one who's going to answer? I hope so. Okay. No, I mean, I I'm asking this question because uh, a couple years ago when we did a renewal, I had asked a, 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 about this because it, 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 we are actually paying for the use of the Gleason uh, well, it's the Presbyterian Church parking lot, correct? Correct. About twelve hundred dollars a year or a month. It's, at this point, it's nineteen hundred and thirty-six dollars okay. a month. Okay. And so, who gets to use that parking lot? All members of the public. Okay. We have no and 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 the way I read the the agreement in there is that there is no subleasing. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. So why is it that there is a uh, valet vendor using it with parking signage that basically says that nobody else is really allowed to park there except for them. I believe that the valet, um, the valet owner has a separate agreement with the Presbyterian Church for a different parking lot. Okay, so where is our parking lot? Because see, this was not in the backup. I couldn't even determine where our, our parking lot was and where this one w would delineate. Where, where is our parking lot? So that, just off of the, there are so many parking uh, lots right there. It's right off of Gleason Street um, to the west of okay. Gleason. There's, do we have park? Do we have parking meters in that parking lot? Yes, ma'am. So that parking lot that literally is backing up to the hotel, I, I believe, off of Gleason, the kind of the corner of the hotel. There's like one on the west side that's completely the city's. Yes, ma'am. So that's not our parking lot. That's that's the the uh, sit, the um, the Church. Presbyterian Church is parking. Yes, ma'am. Okay, and that's the one that we're renewing. Yes, ma'am. Got it. Okay, because I see the interesting thing is is when I was reading it because at one point in time, and I'm telling you, it had to have been eight years ago now. Um, we were talking about the parking lot that actually was part of the church's parking lot as being a parking lot that the city is involved in in leasing. I believe that the church uses this parking lot on Sunday mornings for for their parishioners. Mm -hmm. So this is part of the church's parking lot. No, but I'm talking about separate from that on the east side of Gleason, where the mm -hmm. church stands. 
Oh, no. Okay. Our parking lot is only on the west side. So up in that parking area, we don't have any, because here, here's the interesting thing. When I went back and did the re-reading re re of it, there is a reference to our handling of Brunson and also the gates. So that tell me the, about that. That was the original agreement from 21 years ago. Right. So that that um, original agreement, there were things in it that are just no longer applicable. So I I also looked at that, and I cannot answer your question. Well, the reason I'm asking is because it, it 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 you know there was a point in time where I was told that the parking lot that was where where we see the uh, uh, the Cafe Luna Rosa, using that as their their um, um, valet parking. Mm -hmm. was the part of the parking lot that we were actually we were paying for and that is absolutely not is well, then not why accurate. does Brunson come into play in that in the agreement I cannot answer your question I'll be happy to do some additional research yeah and see if I can find out what the answer I would like to know is. because the truth is is that it's two conflicting things that I've been told over the years and so I drove up there today just because I'm going you know I remember somebody telling me that we actually can park up here during mm -hmm. um, during the week um, in in the Presbyterian parking lot not the one across the street but in the Presbyterian parking lot and now we're talking about a different parking lot being the one that we have the agreement with so I just would really like to have you look into that a little further because I don't want to be paying for you know a a lot that's being leased already by you know obviously Cafe mm -hmm. Luna Rosa and I also don't want to not be able to offer that parking for our own um, constituency if in fact that's what we're paying for so I just want it to be clear um, cleared up that's that's what I, where I'm coming from yes yes I'd like to ask um, Mayor mm -hmm. we have a parking lot that can be used by the public. It's metered. Yes, it is metered. Do we have any directional signs saying it? Is it public parking? Oh, yeah, yeah. No, and there's, a, there's a sign there. It yes. says, okay. yeah, it says public parking, and it has, a, you know, City of Delray was, Beach I and everything. Totally it's very clear. Of it. mm -hmm. But I didn't realize that that's the one we were talking about because of the fact that this agreement has Brunson Way in there and the gates. And again, in the back of my mind, that's what we had talked about years ago right. as being the place where we actually have the agreement with the. Uh, with Presbyterian Church, so do we have a sign on Atlantic Avenue saying public? Parking? I think we do. Yeah, we do. it has directionals. Yep, yeah. I mean that that lot I have no problem with. It was the other lot that I just wanted to make sure of and be clear about. So if you can just figure out why Brunson had anything to do with it, because I have a funny feeling that there might be something there. Oh, I don't know. Well, I'll take a look into it. Sounds I good. will say that we we do make a good profit off this parking lot. Oh no, but. Listen, you wouldn't make any profit if it was the one on uh, uh, on Brunson, off of Brunson. Do you, do you know what I'm saying? Brunson or whatever that right. word is? Because there is no meters up there. You see what I'm saying? So exactly. I, I just is, wanted... That is not part of our lease agreement. Gotcha. Okay. All right. So um, uh, just entertain a motion if someone could do it for me. Motion to approve. Second. Call the roll, please. Mr. Frankel. Yes. Ms. Cassell. Yes. Mr. Boylston. Yes. Ms. Johnson. Yes. Mayor Petrolia. Yes. Thank you very much, Missy. I appreciate it. All right. So we are moving on to 7A, and we have a couple of quasi-judicial hearings. So I'm going to go ahead and read the rules into the record, and then we'll move on to uh, Resolution 80-21. So um, the quasi-judicial rules reading is this. Um, this hearing shall be conducted in accordance with quasi-judicial -judi rules. The applicant and the city shall be permitted to present their cases. The public shall be allowed to speak for three minutes each or a maximum of six minutes if the person represents an organization or a group of people who are present but agree not to speak. The city commission, the staff, and the applicant may be allowed to cross-examine a witness. The city or the applicant will be allowed to offer rebuttal testimony. The decision to approve or deny an application or appeal may not be legally made upon personal views as to whether a project is a good project or not, nor may a decision be based on the number of citizens who support or oppose a, pro a particular project. The law requires that, the, that all decisions must be made on the basis of whether the project meets the requirements of law, the comprehensive plan, and the land development regulations. At this point in time, we're going to swear in um, the witnesses for uh, 7A, 7B, and 7C. So please stand and raise your right hand if you're going to be speaking. Are the authority vested in me as a notary of the state of Florida? Do you swear to affirm? Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, I do. 
Okay, so moving on to 7A, um, which is the um, resolution 80-21. We're gonna be talking about um, uh, anybody with ex parte communications. We'll start with the vice mayor. None. Okay, Deputy Vice Mayor. I wish Heliopolis called me, but no, none. <laughs> uh, Commissioner Boylston. I did get a call today from Mr. Weinberg. Okay, and Commissioner Cassell. We're on Miss A, right? Yeah, I think that that would be the second one, oh, I'm maybe. Sorry. I'm sorry. No, no. Okay, so none, and none for me as well. So at this point in time, city staff, you can um, enter the project file into the record. Good evening, Anthea Genetis, Development Services Director. I'd like to enter file number 2021-133 into the record. And Mr. Legopoulos is here with the presentation on behalf of the applicant. I hope he has his tap shoes on. <laughs> Madam Mayor and Commission, uh, my name is Gary Legopoulos for the record. Our address is 1045 East Atlantic Avenue and we are GE Architecture. Uh, we are representing our client tonight who is here along with our contractor, uh, as you can see up here on the screen, the address is 1031 Seaspray. Um, one of the things that we're going to be talking about, I'll, I'll try to make it as simple as possible. I think it's going to be things that you will be faced with in the near future. Uh, I think it was a couple months ago I stood before you over on Vista Del Mar showing you how the streets are flooding. Uh, this is one of those examples where our client has actually taken the action to make sure that his home is protected. They are in the water. Um, let me just see here how I get this going. Um, it's a unique area in the sense that it's located on Beach Drive and Sea Spray in the intercoastal. Um, one of the things that you're going to find over here, the roads are very low. Uh, when I make reference to elevations, what I am talking about above the sea level. So anytime I say a foot, two feet, it's always the measurement above the sea. Uh, right here you're seeing requesting for a wall height waiver from the required maximum wall height of six feet within the front and side setbacks to nine feet, as per LDR section 4.6.5C. The interesting thing about this is that, and I am suggesting that probably we should direct staff to do a, uh, continue a workshop or do something on this, because the thing is, this is about a privacy wall. We're not here tonight asking for a privacy wall height. Ours is a retaining wall. So there is a difference. We're holding back the earth versus a privacy wall. Obviously, gives you privacy from the public right of way. Uh, here is our site plan. Uh, there's Beach Drive, of course, on the north, and Sea Spray along the south, which is a cul-de-sac. So one of the things we're going to be going over is we've, we're basically going to show you the elevation, looking at this portion of the house, and how it affects Beach Drive. Beach Drive is a very low uh, grade elevation. Uh, this is the north elevation of the proposed house. It is under construction right now. So beach drives there. I'm going to flash some numbers here. These numbers are actually how high they are above sea level. So as you go over to the right, you're seeing that we're basically a foot and a half above the sea level. So it is very low. One of the things that we've decided to do is look into the code. We have FEMA regulations. Now, that's the state. The state, which I know you guys have been hearing about, has made regulations on what heights need to be. So the FEMA for this house is at seven feet. Now what the building code talks about is you have to be a foot above that. Okay, so now we're talking eight feet. One of the other things that staff's been faced with in a lot of the communities around here is that the state now is looking at pending codes. Pending code right now is talking about raising the FEMA seven to eight, which would mean this house would need to be at nine in the future. Our client chose to build at nine. Um, one of the things also that's important to look at is with regards to when you pick an elevation like that and the road abutting against you is so low, you have two options. One is to build the earth up and build retaining walls. The other is to have steps. In this case, we'd have roughly 14 to 15 steps leading up to the house. Now, one of the positives about what we're doing is it actually will treat it as a holding area. Uh, we actually chose blue. In theory, when you think about this street, when you think about the rain, similar to what we had today, but some of the heavier rains that we'll get during the summer, the road tends to flood, the intercoastal tends to flood. This street beach does have a lift station. The lift station is used to pump it into the intercoastal. The intercoastal goes up, there's no way to pump it. By raising the grade all around here and doing retaining walls, we actually have a nice holding area. It actually is gonna help the area. Um, so what's happening is we're coming out of our house approximately two feet. We're going to step down, and that's where we're showing right now an elevation of six feet. This would be six feet above the adjacent road. Uh, 
Now the issue is you start talking about children, you start talking about dogs, things like that. You obviously don't want somebody falling over. Um, so we've proposed a three foot high railing. We're trying to be uh, reasonable with it. I, I, I've talked to my client, I, I worry because he does have dogs and sometimes you can have a hyper dog and a three foot rail is not that high. Um, but that's what we are showing right now. So here's, here's the proposed house. It's actually under construction, not proposed. Um, but you can see the black chain link fence right there is actually at an elevation of five feet. Um, we do have the house. You can barely see in this, I, I, I thought I could actually point, the, the actual finished floor of the doors is at the nine feet, which is almost the top of the railing that you're seeing probably right in the middle of this slide. Uh, this is actually looking from the property, looking down towards the street. And this is actually from Beach Drive. Um, so this is what we're dealing with. We did talk to staff and we talked about one of the things is you're allowed to do the retaining wall. Basically, we usually do it approximately three inches off the property line. That's actually for what we call a footing and then it cantilevers in. We've shifted the wall uh, two feet into the property in order to do a landscape buffer so that the adjacent neighbors will be walking by and not seeing that, but actually seeing landscaping. Uh, this is actually just driving up to the proposed garages. And now I'll cut a couple little quick sections for you. So here's what we're talking about. This is the north property line. It is adjacent to Beach Drive. And these numbers are basically all the stuff that we deal with FEMA. Uh, you can see the uh, acronym at the end, which is NAVD. We're basically talking about above sea level. And then simple dimensions, that's what we are talking about. So when you see over on the right-hand side, those are doors leading out to three steps, coming down to grade, and then you hit what we are proposing for along the property line. As you go towards the east on beach, the grade actually goes a little bit up higher, and we actually come down, so the wall actually does start reducing in height. And you see we're picking up about another foot and a half. And that's the proposed elevation. So it will be heavily landscaped. Uh, we think it's, it's, it's a win-win for everybody in this part of this street, especially with the kind of drainage that we are occurring. Now the south side is probably a little different and the fact is on the south side of this property, there's a 10 foot easement. It's heavily vegetated. You can't see this from the public right of way. So I don't think uh, it's as big of a concern uh, because the fact is nobody's ever going to see it. Uh, it's the opposite of what happens on Beach Drive. When you're close to the water, the grade change is actually less versus as you go towards the east and you hit sea spray. The difference being three and a half feet, and then you're talking, we, we, again, we're here because we are over the six foot mark. Now as you get towards the section D that I just showed you, now you see there's a bigger grade change. Again, we are still at the same number that we were on the north side, which is the nine feet. Uh, this is this side of Beach Drive as far as access to the property. Uh, here you could just barely see a chain link fence in the shrubs there. I mean, you can see that it's quite low. That is a five foot high fence. Another shot looking out towards the water. And that's the uh, rendering that we were proposing for our client. Uh, that concludes my presentation. I. Uh, do hope that uh, you'll give us a positive consideration tonight. Thank you very much. Okay, so um, just a second. All right, so what is before us, I think it's important to recognize um, we fully expect to see this type of situation again. And so if you can look at it, you know, under um, the lens of how we need to move forward as the new FEMA maps um, are adopted over time. Um, the property is zoned R1 AAA. Um, it is also in the North Beach Overlay District, which is subject to the beach property um, owner's manual um, and we actually struggled a little bit to determine how to bring this to you in terms of what was it because the applicant is correct it's not really a fence but the perception of what you would see as a neighbor is very much a garden wall of six feet and then if we said well it's not a fence you can take the fence 
which is measured typically from undisturbed grade, right? So now <laughs> it's not exactly undisturbed or grade anymore, and put another six-foot fence on top of it, just visually the impact of that could be significant. In this case, the applicant's requesting, you know, a very, um, I think, artful and, and, and has tried to reduce the request as much as possible to three feet um, on top of the retaining wall. So ultimately, if we look at it as a wall or fence or hedge, if it's in the front yard, meaning it's, it's not meeting those setbacks, it's limited to six feet. Um, the only direction the code currently provides is that earth retraining walls are listed as an example of a minor structure. However, there isn't any real uh, direction towards how to handle the setbacks and what happens on top of them later. Um, we knew how to deal with the house, but ultimately, you know, how do we deal with these issues coming forward? In this case, it does have two frontages. The access is considered to be from sea spray, so this is the front setback. This is a side interior. There's a side street ultimately on Beach Drive. The rear is technically the intercoastal and because this is technically a public easement, um, this is also considered a side street. So it, you know, it's a little bit unique in, this, in its configuration as well. Um, the house did go through a complete beach property owner's manual review and it was approved and this is um, ultimately what's before, you, before us is how to deal with the changing world we live in. The current FEMA map um, has this property as um, what's called an AE6 for the special flood hazard area, meaning that it needs to be at that 6 NAVD above um, sea level. Um, the maps that are currently under review and anticipated for adoption move this particular part of the block to an 8. Mm -hmm. So there was, um, a, while it increases the request, I think that you know, we can all acknowledge this was proactive to, to build um, beyond and more in line with what's coming forward. Florida Building Code will require another foot on top of whatever FEMA sets as the minimum. So now we're at nine. Um, I've honestly, uh, while the request is to have the six foot retaining wall treated in a landscape method similar to the way a masonry wall or a fence would be required with landscaping between the public right of way and the retaining wall, then to enclose the, the yard, the way all of us use a single family yard, we don't have a provision for that in the code. And, and the applicant's only asking for three feet. I'm the one who's raised that my dog would get over that three feet pretty quickly. <laughs> so be sure you're asking for what you truly need so we don't have to kind of come back. Um, so ultimately, to give the waiver, the question is whether this design as presented to you would adversely affect the area or diminish public facilities, um, and would it create an unsafe situation? In this case, I think it's actually critical to resolving what is potentially an unsafe situation, um, and is it a special privilege in that a similar waiver would be granted to someone with similar circumstances? Um, you know, we ultimately have to make some decisions as our more vulnerable areas redevelop, whether um, with a retaining wall should meet setbacks, in, in which case, what you've seen, uh, I think Mr. Eliopoulos present, is that the grade is, try, is handled in a number of ways, steps to the house, steps to the yard. I think the yard actually has a terrace at one point, too, between the part that's closest to the intercoastal, then it steps down, um, or a combination of those, and how we're gonna look at that over time. Uh, so that concludes my presentation at this point, and I'll leave it to questions from the commission and the applicant. Okay, great. Well, we're going to move on to um, the um, public, if anybody in the public would like to speak to this um, issue, this agenda item, you can step up and, and speak now. Seeing no one, public comment is closed, and we are no longer call in, correct? Correct. Okay. So, uh, moving backwards to um, the city staff and uh, the uh, applicant, any cross examination from either, and any rebuttal. No. Okay. So to the commission. Anyone want to start? Yes, Commissioner Sal. I actually think it's. I like how you shifted the wall in and put the foliage. Um, so I appreciate that aspect. If I may, the property that abuts the neighbor's house. That's the same wall is slightly in and then there's foliage I'm just to the south get to a picture. correct so there's the sea spray house or the yes that one so that one will not have a wall 
that okay. already has just a regular fence with heavy vegetation. Got it. Thank you very much. Is there, um, while you're on that, just come back because um, is there a difference in the um, in the height of the of the ground to that that one to the east? No. And we how about it. and how about to the south? You have two abutting. Um, there's two properties that abut. So the one to the south, that's got to be higher, correct? Yes. So. Yes. Is there a way that there is going to be water that will not necessarily uh, travel to there? Is it the wall that's going to keep the water from traveling yes. to their property? Okay. Yeah, the wall actually will be, Madam Mayor, higher than the grade. We're going right. to drop it okay. so that the water's not going over. Gotcha. Okay. I just want to make sure that we're protecting those those neighbors. You got it. Um, anything else, Commissioner? No? Who else? Anyone? That, yes. that was my question. Uh, the surrounding neighbors obviously have no problem. They are not here, so I'm sure they were aware. Um, just like to make one other comment. I don't know if we can pull up the uh, display of the flood. Um, flood zoning. And the, uh, there it is. Flood zone, yes. I don't know if the property owners in those areas are aware of this. There have been meetings, I suppose, and I don't want to call attention to it, but we need to let them know, maybe. Right. We um, we are um, in the review period for the change to two feet, and um, new construction would then have to be elevated to match that. Um, and certainly, existing construction becomes sort of non-conforming legally. Um, but we are uh, discussing when to hold a workshop on this exact change of the maps. Don't want to panic them, but right. we're going to be working on the LDRs so that we don't have to have these kind of discussions eventually, maybe a couple of years, I don't know. Right, if that's the direction for, for us to tackle how to handle the retaining walls, that we will add that to the list for sure. I would also recommend just um, once you get to that point um, where we're talking about workshop for us, reaching out to BPOA because I'm sure that they would probably want to have a, maybe a charrette or two in order to be able to make sure that uh, the community knows what's what's cutting their way. Uh, it's already probably obvious, but uh, anyway, um, Commissioner, I mean. I was just going to say, Gary, you look great in that ascot. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Commissioner Boylston, did you have anything you wanted to add? No. Yeah. I, I want to also just add that this is sea level rise, obviously, we're, we're dealing with, and this has been something that's been oncoming, and it's starting to hit us. And obviously, we are adjusting, and we're starting to um, move in the direction of uh, ad adaptation, and I'm proud of that. And I think that you guys did a really beautiful job of uh, figuring out a way to be able to take an absolutely exquisite piece of property wherever your owners are. Congratulations. Yeah, you have a beautiful piece of property there. Um, and um, and and de design something that's not going to be offensive to your neighbors, at, as well as making sure that you'll be able to be there for the next uh, you know several decades, um, hopefully with without any uh, problems. And probably our, our streets are going to be following your efforts as we as we move forward um, in this uh, new world that is being created by Mother Nature. Just, yes. just one more comment. I'd like to commend the staff. Beautiful optics mm -hmm. and. Mr. Gary, thank you. You got it. Thank you very much. You got Motion it. to approve. Second. Call the roll, please. Ms. Cassell? Yes. Mr. Boylston? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mayor Petrolia? Yes. Mr. Franco? Yes. Congratulations. Good luck. Thank Can't you. wait to see the finished product. Okay, so we're moving on to 7B, um, resolution 89-21. Good evening. Uh, for the record, Anthea Genetis, Development Services Director, and I'd like to enter file number 2021-145 to the record. Okay, um, and so this is yep. the one that we're actually talking about with uh, Max, correct? So let me go through the disclosure of uh, ex parte because it sounded like we had some just, just a second. Um, uh, Vice Mayor, did you have any? Yeah. None. Ex parte, None. Deputy Vice Mayor? None. Okay, uh, Commissioner Boylston, you said you did, right? Yes, this is the. Okay, and then I did as well. Okay, and I had none. All right, very good. So the um, the um, application has been, uh, or the project file has been entered into the record. The applicant, you have the floor. Thank you, Mayor Thank Petrolia you. and commissioners, and staff and associates. It's nice to see you live and in person. Yes, likewise. Not Zoom. Good evening, and for the record, I'm I'm the applicant of Agenda Seven uh, B. Uh, Max Weinberg, and on behalf of my wife Becky and myself, I'd like to thank you for considering our application for a front setback waiver. 
as we begin our restoration of a 1937 French Creole style cottage located at 1221 Lang Street. Gary Eliopoulos will fill you in on all the details, but I'd like to say with this project, we're endeavoring to fulfill the mandate of the new Always Delray comp plan to utilize creative ways of adaptively reusing existing housing stock and in doing so adhere to the directive of comp plan objective HOU 1.3, which says, and I quote, to protect existing residential areas by fostering development and redevelopment that is consistent with the unique character of the neighborhood. We believe we've satisfied that mission with our plan. Over there are a little enclave of five homes at Sandpiper and Lang Streets. We all have the same conditions of encroaching into the current setback limits. And in our case, a uh, 5,000 square foot lot in a 12,500 square foot uh, area. Uh, at this particular property, the side setback line went directly through the center of the house. So we've been very fortunate to be the recipients of four variances recently granted by the Board of Adjustment to address the irregularities of the existing house, which are many, and the lot on which it, it has stood for 84 years. The final piece of our puzzle would be to grant our team the waiver we're seeking tonight with respect to the front overhang, which when lined up with the existing overhang would encroach into the front setback. So again, I wanna thank you for the, your consideration of this request. And with that, I'd like to turn our presentation over to the very capable, very overworked, and very articulate Gary Eliopoulos. <laughs> Gary? No. I don't know about that, but thank you, Max. Uh, for the record, Gary Leopolis, uh, 1045 East Atlantic Avenue, GE Architecture. Uh, as stated, we are uh, happy to be here tonight, and uh, we appreciate you guys listening to what we're presenting. We think it is a very unique opportunity. Uh, it's a special uh, situation that we have. As far as the area goes, we're talking about a special uh, situation. Uh, Lang Street is actually a one-way street and it runs in the west to east direction. Uh, Max's house is actually located right on the corner of Sandpiper Lane. Sandpiper Lane is unique in the sense that it's almost like a driveway. It serves basically five homes. You barely can get up this street, but it is unique in that sense. All the homes, as Max stated, are on unique pieces of property that are actually well below the minimum requirement. So the zoning that we are dealing with over there is R1 AAA. As Max stated, the minimum lot sizes are 12,500. Tonight, what we are gonna be doing is requesting a waiver from section 4.3.4H4D, structures allowed in a setback, which states the following structures are allowed and required setbacks pursuant to the stipulations contained herein. D, house eaves not exceeding a three foot overhang. So basically what tonight we are talking about is we have a porch, it's under the overhang. Normally in Delray, you would actually allow the three feet. Our situation is different because the house is all over the setbacks and doesn't comply with anything. Um, our client has proposed to construct a balcony to encroach into the front setback. It's actually four feet, two inches. What I'm doing here and stating why we're at nine nine is because the house is actually encroaching five foot six into the setback. Um, as stated before, these are simple numbers that we're dealing with. Minimum lot size is 12,500 for R1 AAA. You can see the dimensions for a lot size. Minimum is 100 by 110. My client's property is 5,398. What's unique about that is the sense our smallest zone, R1 single A, minimum lot size is 7,500. We don't even comply with that. So this is a very special situation in that what happened was over the years, the properties have all been subdivided into smaller lots. Uh, we are fortunate that there are a few of these historic homes that are still there. We know it's been the trend in Delray Beach. It's basically been to tear these things down and build new. Um, so here's what we have on our property. Uh, right now, what we are showing in the red that's where the house actually the existing house sits over the setbacks okay so the front setback is 35 feet at the ground floor we encroach five foot six so here's what our code is reading we're basically for the first floor our existing house is at 29 six 
The BPOA, they actually call for 35, just as our R1 AAA. And we're proposing to, now this is the unique part, we're actually picking the house up. We're picking the house up and we're gonna build a new ground floor. It will be a three-story house. What's happening is it, in this 1937 home, it is wood frame. Uh, the house actually sits into the earth along the back portion of the property. And over time, the water has gotten in and actually has eaten all the wood away. Um, it's always nice to talk about what they call Miami-Dade wood. We always like to say okay, it's durable. Termites do not like it. In fact, they will eat it. They do not like it. It is true, but it does get eaten. So we felt that if we lift the house up, we can actually salvage everything there, correct it, and then build a new block foundation, concrete, and actually have it raised for what we talked about earlier with Anthea, the new flood regulations. And we're going to have the, the ground floor raised above it. Um, so what happens is once we pick this up, the second floor, which is right now the ground floor, <laughs> everything's going to go up another. So second floor is going to become the third floor. And I'm kind of going to go through some of this stuff because it just it gets a little confusing, but we do have a diagram that will show it. One of the interesting things, the, the uh, BPOA does have a 45-foot second floor setback. That's only if you want to get extra lock coverage. You shift the house further back. Otherwise, you can stick with the 35. Um, again, you see what we are proposing. It's basically because of the porch, it would be 9 foot 8. And this is the proposed ground floor where we actually are keeping the footprint. We're just basically building a whole new ground floor. The second floor, what's appearing to be of the green, that's the part that we are adding a porch to mimic what is now going to be the third floor porch. And this would be our third floor. So when I get to this next slides, as far as the elevation kind of does tell the story, um, there's how much the existing house encroaches into the side setbacks. And the part that we'll be discussing is the 35 foot at the lower right hand corner. As we lift the house up, we're taking what is now the second floor porch and we're mimicking it and I'm going to put on the new second floor level. This is looking towards the east. And this is now what would be proposed for the east so that second floor porch is what you're actually voting on tonight. So this little diagram kind of shows what we're proposing to do. Uh, there's your existing structure. We're basically picking it up. We're going to be building a whole new ground floor. Uh, the balcony that you can see on the far left slides in, basically inserting it there. The finished product would be that. The subject property, there's to uh, summarize what we're talking about, is a non-conforming lot. I think this is important where it's non-conforming. We're talking about the minimum 12,500 square feet. The existing is 5398. I think it's also important to understand the date of this home. It is not protected. So anybody can knock this down and build what we're seeing now is the modern sugar cube houses all over town. Uh, that's the part that's incredible. You know, a lot of times some of the, uh, the realtors are reaching out to me on some of my projects and like, why are you doing it? Well, this is what you do when you really want to preserve history and the character of Delray Beach. Uh, this is part of our fabric. As I said, this is a unique part of our town where we have quite a few Sam Augren homes still there. They've been saved, they've been renovated, and it's great to see that our client is willing to take on this challenge. And that is your finished product. So with that, uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have uh, after staff's report. Uh, it's interesting, we've, we've moved 13 homes in Delray Beach since 98 that I've saved homes. Several of them are now on the local register. It was great to see that Michelle did a presentation tonight because we moved one on Swinton back in 98. It was part of the Worrell project, the Sunday house. It was part of the mm -hmm. church down there. We picked it up and moved it and those people actually designated. So that was great to see. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I don't have a lot to add, and um, but let me just put a couple things on the record. Again, uh, it's single family, residential, R1 AAA. It is subject to um, the Beach Property Owner's Design Manual. Ultimately, when improvements come forward, it would be reviewed under that um, 
that manual as well as zoning. Um, the lot is less than half the size of what the zoning um, anticipates and the rules um, that govern the development. Um, the home was built in 1938, and on April 1st, the Board of Adjustment approved several setback variances to allow um, the project to move forward. Ultimately, what's before you are not those variances. They've been granted under that, um, that board's purview, but what is um, before you today is ultimately when you have an existing nonconformity, you can't increase or expand it. Um, without meeting the findings. The setbacks were handled through the Board of Adjustment and now ultimately the, um, the balcony in the second floor, um, the new second floor porch would be under, the, under your purview, um, subject to the waiver findings. Um, currently the, um, the goal is to uh, lift the entire residence and um, build a new first story, um, but I would also suggest that if that uh, plan were to change to simply just elevating the house as well um, that you know similar porch or balcony improvements um, you know would also be considered in that manner so climate change is obviously the issue that we're discussing tonight and how to preserve things for the next round um, and so this is what's before you this is the existing balcony the code through a series of interpretations treats these types of, of um, setback encroachments as overhangs. Um, I'm already working on an amendment for that, <laughs> but to clarify the different architectural elements a little bit better. Um, but in this case, the overhang would shift up to become the new third floor, and then um, the desire is to augment the original design with a new second story balcony that um, is similar to the first. And this is the subject of the waiver, not the setback variances, none of that. Only the balcony and the element, um, the proposed mirrored element is what is before you today. And those standards are whether or not granting and allowing that um, design element to come forward into the setback would adversely affect the neighborhood, um, whether it affects public facilities, creates an unsafe situation, or is a special privilege. Um, and I'm here if you have any questions. Thank you. All right, very good. So moving on to public comment, if there's anybody here that would like to make a public comment on this agenda item, please step forward. Seeing no one, public comment is closed. Moving back to both the applicant and the city. Any um, cross-examination? Any rebuttal testimony? Seeing none, go to the commission. I have a question for you just real quick. You know, we were talking about um, the last house raising it because of the um, elevation requirement. Is this in a situation where they do not have that issue with respect to the, um, the base at, at seven or nine feet? What, what's the deal with that? Yeah, this is, this is not as bad because it definitely does slope up mm -hmm. from A1A and then goes back down. There's been, like I said, because of the way the house is placed into the earth, there's been some, but it definitely hasn't been exposed to what you see down in Vista Del Mar. But I guess my question is, is that it does, is the, are the, are the flood maps going to require that this be higher elevation? I see that it seems to be at grade in this picture, so I'm questioning whether or not this has the same issue as the last. Um, uh, it will. It will. So why would you not add the elevation? Um, why, why would you not raise the elevation? of the house or the foundation of the house in order to be able to meet that standard that's coming. I'm sorry, Madam, we are oh. we're raising it two feet gotcha. above what it is now. So we are going to the nine. Okay. It sorry. just looked like it was at grade. That's yeah. why I was asking to make sure that you're keeping in mind because it looks like it's not. And I didn't know if that was just because of the topography of where, where it was uh, situated. So very good. Just want to make sure that that was um, yeah, well, that's, that's true too. Yeah. Okay, okay, so I just for the record, I do want to put on that it is in a different um, flood zone designation. Yeah. It's zone X. Okay. So that measures it against Crown of Road, and then Florida Building Code adds another foot, and then you're allowed to freeboard in order to, you know, protect yourself against the future, basically. Gotcha. So, so there is some hardening, but it's not the grade change that you just saw with the Cortezi residence. Perfect. Thank you so very much to the commission. I have a yes. couple of questions. I'm Vice Mayor. I'm concerned for the surrounding neighbors. You're not. You're putting in a wall. Is that? I see in your your proposed that there's a big white. That's it's already there. So we don't have the wall situation. Not not like the previous one. No. This is this is an existing wall, 
and we are maintaining that wall around the property. And the neighbors are not going to be flooded or water runoff? Or? No, the water, everything that we're doing, we will have to provide engineering, civil engineering to the city to show that we are not encroaching on anybody's property with the water runoff. We have to contain it on our property. These walls actually help create that situation. And again, I don't see any opposing neighbor saying this is going to block my son. And as I've as we've seen with some of the other um, projects in on the barrier. Yeah, what's unique about this is the sense that, we, so when you're dealing with these older homes, the ceiling heights are actually eight feet. The homes that we design now are usually between 10 and 12 feet ceiling heights. So you actually get a lot more height. We got a three-story house and we will be actually lower than your typical two-story house that you're seeing that's brand new. Mm -hmm. Does it take a lot of hmm? So I think the other thing to keep in mind as we grow and change is that all of the residential districts, including this one, allow three stories at 35 feet. So, you know, they're within that. Okay. They're just wanting to reuse and maintain and preserve the existing house. Thank you. Commissioner so. Boston, anything? No. no anything? Anyone? Commissioner. Motion to approve. Second. Oh, the roll. I'm, you know, let me just make one more mention because I just wanted to say something specific to this because it, I don't want anybody thinking that we're doing something that we wouldn't do for somebody else. This is preserving a um, an original house, and it's the same footprint just raised. So uh, to me, if somebody came with that situation again, I, I would be approving it as well. Uh, so I don't see it as being having a special privilege. I just want to make sure that I put that on record because I may think that you're doing that, but it, it's it's doing two things, and I I support it 100%. So call the roll, please. Thank you, Mr. Boston. Yes. Miss Johnson. Yes. Mayor Petrolia. Yes. Mr. Frankel. Yes. Miss Cassell. Yes. Thank you. Good Thank luck. you very much. You got it. Thank all right, all. moving on to resolution thank number. Oh, thank you. So so good to see you in person as well, Max. Thank you. You got it. Good to see you. Thanks. And good luck to you. Um, resolution number 94-21. Is Anthea? Yes. Um, so Anthea Genetis Development Services Director. For the record, I'd like to enter file 2019-189 um, into the record. And I'm hoping the applicant is here. Yes. Okay, <laughs> we just, we don't meet people in person anymore, so <laughs> it's always a surprise. Um, do you want me to give an overview, or do you want uh, to? I, this is a pretty simple Okay, so um, what, can you, um, where is this? This is, what? what's the, um, okay, here we go. Yes, okay, so this is um, the new uh, gas station convenient mart. It's a 7-Eleven that is yep. being constructed at the southeast corner of Linton and South uh, Military Trail. It's located at... Um, 16,000 South Military Trail. Okay, and so let me just ask if there's any ex parte first with the uh, commission, Deputy Vice, I mean the Vice Mayor? None. Deputy Vice Mayor? None. Uh, Commissioner Boylston, Commissioner no. Cassell? No. And none for me. So we can move on to uh, the city, uh, the applicant, if you'd like to make any comment or if the city is just going to uh, make a presentation. Hey there. Hi, hello, thank you. Oh. Is your name and... Uh, uh, my name is Jorge Valle from um, Keith, representing the... Uh, Can you say your name again? I'm sorry, I didn't hear it. Jorge. Jorge, okay, Jorge. very good, thank you. Hi, my first time here, so... Um, anyways, um, representing the 7-Eleven, um, um, which is um, um, building um, this um, gas station, um, currently is under construction, and when it went through the um, city for the um, site plan um, process, site plan approval, there was a portion of the um, easement that is um, basically where the um, proposed building would be. So one of the, the only condition of approval for the site plan was that that um, portion that is highlighted on um, orange that was um, abandoned. Um, everything was submitted to the city, um, including engineering and um, planning. Um, and our motion is to just um, remove that um, little portion of the easement. So. Very good, thank you so much, Jorge. Um, so. Okay, Anthea? so um, this actually is a portion of an easement that I believe used to service a uh, fire hydrant mm -hmm. and they're constructing the building there now and so that piece needs to um, just, it's a technical adjustment, some housekeeping to accommodate the new construction that was approved. Um, the code does require commission action for um, basically right of way or abandonment easements. Um, 
that, uh, that it won't result in a detriment for the provision of utility services. And so in this case, it's solely serving their development and no longer needed. Very That's good. It. Okay, if there's anybody at the audience that would like to come and speak to um, this uh, agenda item, please step forward. Seeing no one, the comment is closed to the commission. Oh, well, first of all, let me ask if there's any um, cross-examination by either the applicant or the city and any rebuttal testimony, seeing that there's none to the commission. Any questions, I concerns? One, I just have one question. Sure. Did this not, um, was this not something we were aware of before when we were giving permission or did it come up later? I'm just confused as to why we didn't do this previously. So it's the redevelopment of a gas station. There was already a gas station with a convenience mart on the site, but it was laid out in a completely different configuration. So when they decided to uh, redo the building and build a new building, they built it in a different location and the old easement doesn't uh, work for mm -hmm. the new design. So once SPRAV approved it, then we um, required that they come here and sort of clean up that easement location to match the new design for the new building. Very good. Thank it's you. Just housekeeping. Right. Motion to approve? Second. Call the roll, please. Mr. Bolston? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mayor Petrolia? Yes. Mr. Frankel? Yes. Ms. Cassell? Yes. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you. You got it. All right, moving on to 7D, ratification of the emergency regulations. Number 61 and 62. Motion to approve. Second. Call the roll. Ms. Johnson. Yes. Mayor Petrolia. Yes. Mr. Frankel. Yes. Ms. Cassell. Yes. Mr. Boylston. Yes. And seeing that there is no public hearings or second readings or first readings, we are at comments and inquiries Yay. of non-agenda items, and we'll start with the city manager. Sarah, I have a few items, okay. but they will be brief. <laughs> Um, on, the, on those emergency regulations, I did want to just mention that although uh, a lot of our COVID measures are kind of slowly um, going back to normal, I do intend to keep these in place at least for a while longer. Part of that is to ensure that we remain in consideration for any FEMA funding reimbursement requests that may be coming through. So that's just one of the reasons why we'll still probably see these coming on the agendas for the next, I don't know, few weeks or so, let's see, let's say. Um, the other thing I did want to let you know, I just sent an email to you as we were sitting here. I was advised that we have a water main break. It is, I'm going to open my email so I can read it, actually, at 824 Club Drive, I believe, and approximately 160 customers are and what we are estimating right now is affected by this. Um, Wait, do we know where Club Drive is? is Your that? high point according to the map. Okay, thank you. All right, pulled it up already. I right. have your email. All right. <laughs> um, as of right now, they don't have, they're just going to be going through some intermittent shutoffs mm -hmm. and low water pressure, and that will be followed by a boil water notice. Okay. Um, we have advised the Department of Health. So I will be keeping you apprised as we go through all of our standard protocols, as usual, when we have these incidents. And then the last thing is another fun thing. If you were to head over to the city's Facebook page in celebration of uh, Pride Month, our logo has uh, the, the Pride mm -hmm. flag logo um, colors on it. So go ahead and head over there. We did that last year for Pride Month and we're doing it again this year. Fantastic. All right, that's all I have. Okay, so to the commission, or sorry, to the city. Attorney, I'm sorry. <laughs> I actually have something. All right. Um, I did send an email earlier today. We have received a proposal for settlement in the case of D John Delianibus um, and others versus City of Delray Beach. You know this uh, more commonly as 100 Gleason Street, mm -hmm. the appurtenance um, lawsuit. So um, I, I had proposed July 6th at 3 o'clock. We have a commission meeting July 6th at 4 o'clock. So I just figured one hour before, kind of like what we did today with the executive session. Does that work for Fine. everybody? If so, yeah. I can announce it and we can vote on it. Perfect. Yes. Great. Okay, so I am requesting um, to discuss the settlement proposal in the case of John Delianibus et al. versus City of Delray Beach, 50-2020-CA-011984 on July 6, uh, 2021 at 3 p.m. 
The session will last approximately 60 minutes. In attendance will be Mayor Petrolia, Vice Mayor Johnson, Deputy Vice Mayor Frankel, Commissioner Boylston, Commissioner Casal, Interim City Manager Jennifer Alvarez, myself, William Bennett, and a certified court reporter. Um, and if I could just get a motion and a second. So moved. Second. Call the roll, please. Mayor Petrolia? Yes. Mr. Frankel? Yes. Ms. Cassell? Yes. Mr. Bolston? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. And that's it. Thank you. Very good. To the commission. Who would like to start? Mr. Cassell? Oh, uh, I don't have any updates, but I would like to announce um, at the CRA meeting, James McRae handed out flyers to us mm -hmm. regarding a, I took a picture of it, a Father's Day chess tournament at the Spady Cultural Museum on Saturday, June 19th from 10 to 2. Um, I'd also like to note that um, we discussed opportunities and I would be amenable to allowing them to continue to use the outside area if we can accommodate them and then others on a case-by-case -case basis only. I, and that's the question, I know I see the cringe. <laughs> that is a very unusual area in that if you drive by there, it is really just businesses. And um, so anyway, Lynn, to you, I apologize. So, and of course I closed down my computer where I had the um, actual, it's in the code of, so it's, this is a little tricky because it's in the code of ordinances. And so, um, you know, these are the laws, the ordinances that if somebody were to violate, they do suffer um, potential criminal penalties. So it, th that was the issue. Um, they did bring forth a privately initiated um, change to the code, which it's really, it really has to be driven by the commission. If the commission were to deny it, then you could do initiative or a referendum or something to that effect. So the, co the code of ordinances talks about um, where you can have alcohol. And it pretty much, you know, it's, it's like the state's open container law. So really, even if we did make this change, we'd have to look at the state's open container laws because with open containers, you really aren't supposed to be walking around with open containers unless you have some kind of a waiver or something to that effect. So um, we can look into it. Um, happy to look into it, but I, the concern is, and I'd have to do research to see how state law, um, right. we can't be in conflict with state law. I guess what that's is, the What is the easiest way to move forward with opportunity, opportunities? My, my question was gonna be, and hi, Ms. Geyser, it's good to see you. Uh, they, we do it at Saltwater. They have picnic tables outside. It's the right. exact same beer, wine. I think it's because it's on their property. Isn't, it's on their property too. Man. I'm just trying to figure out if you can, and it doesn't have to necessarily, you, we're not going to put you on the spot right no, now, but right. It, it's not that we're wanting to do this a blanket because you can understand that this right. is going to be a problem and create a problem in a certain general area. However, this has not been a problem and this has been beneficial to this business. So I don't know how we can do it, but if you can give it some of your time to figure out how, what is the easiest way that you can approach this, I think you have consensus to move forward. So they, they are permitted. It's on business property outside the building with the exception that patrons seated at permanent tables provided by the business may consume um, mm -hmm. beverages what during the... Oh, sorry, I lost my... May consume alcoholic beverages. Anthea's also chiming in. I don't know if she left, but there's also an issue with the COP license. So I, we, we have to look into it. Okay, so don't, let's, let us not put you on the spot, but just understand right. that you have consensus to look into this further. I think you do, may, right? May, yes. May I ask Commissioner Cassell, I caught the first part about the chess club. You were not suggesting some kind of alcoholic beverages Oh, at the chess club? My gosh, no, 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 okay. no, no, no. Oh, okay. that was sorry, two different you, announcements. You went well, listen, if I'm playing, you know. <laughs> no, no, no. no. I'm kidding. There might be children. I'm joking. So. That was a joke. Yeah. Um, no, those were the, the chess club was announcement, and then because Miss Kaiser is, has sat here all evening, I just thought I'd bring up the subject matter. Very good. Thank you. Anything I, else? The, the transition I missed. I'm sorry. My apologies. That's right. Anything else? No, thank okay. you. Deputy Vice Mayor. No, and I was going to say, I, we did it with um, Saltwater. Mm -hmm. it's, to me, it's the same setup. There's picnic tables, food, and it's beer and wine, which may separate it. And I don't know what the governor's new thing about now you can buy liquor to go. Mm -hmm. I don't know how that plays into things, but um, I would support it, and I'm glad um, we brought that up. And um, Anthea, I'm glad you're back, because I was just going to reiterate what I said at the last meeting regarding uh, goal setting uh, Thursday and Friday. One of the things I'm gonna be looking for is 
what we can do for you and, and Lynn, your department and other departments in the city to, you know, I, I know three years ago I made a plea to get electronic submissions to make things easier, charge a higher fee, and everyone wins. Um, it seems to me that maybe because of the pandemic, staffing, uh, in, I don't know at City Hall, but certainly in other areas of our city, in private businesses, there's no staffing. You know, people are, are, are begging to get people to work. And uh, up until now, people haven't been jumping out there for one reason or another. So to me, I don't know if that information can be gathered by you, by other department heads. I just want to see who needs staffing, what could make things work better for our existing departments. I know uh, I spoke to Lynn, I don't know if it was last week or the week before, she, she's putting out uh, uh, a notice for a paralegal. It seems like that could help her department. So um, hopefully we can get that information uh, for Thursday and Friday. And uh, I can't wait to spend eight to five. <laughs> yes. With your favorite people? Yeah. <laughs> Oh my goodness. That's it. Let's All get right, out of here before the good. rain comes. The rain's coming, Shirley. You better hurry. Com Commissioner Boylston, do you have anything? No. Okay, okay. <laughs> First, Vice I need Mayor. to turn the, the microphone on. Uh, I'd like to um, take this opportunity to say we are about to prayerfully enter into an opportunity we all have wished for stabilization of the city at the city manager level. First of all, I'd like to thank uh, ICM Alvarez for all of her contributions in keeping us going during this difficult time, uh, transition in management, and you took over, stepped right in. COVID-19, you've kept us abreast, uh, sometimes more than I wanted to know about, but everyone, please get your vaccination, and at this particular time, if you want to tell us how the, what is it, shot for shots went, uh, I'll interrupt and because that sounded intriguing. Uh, we still don't have the numbers uh, just yet from the healthcare district. We're waiting to receive those numbers to, to basically ascertain how many individuals were vaccinated. Um, but they will be back. We will be back because we offered both the Johnson & Johnson as well as the Pfizer. So anybody that did receive the Pfizer um, will come back on in three weeks. So Very good. But as soon as I get those that information, I'll be sharing that. That's, I, I really didn't really want to know the numbers, just that it happened and and shots. Yes, ma'am, Saturday arms. and Sunday. Right. I'd also like to, at this moment, we received vaccines for, in the city. Eventually, maybe you'll tell us what happened with those. Did we they're go door hit, to door? They're being done. My All son done. got a shot uh, today, as a matter of fact. Yes, uh, I, on Tuesdays at our fire rescue department, we are still vaccinating as well until that those supplies would be exhausted. Are we going door to door, or are we just setting up in a park? Or We, we have them at the, the okay. fire station now, but we also have the ability to take them out. And one of the populations that we were working on targeting was homeless population, uh, because we also did have uh, Johnson & Johnson. Um, so that's well part of what we are able to accomplish as well. I just wondered how many senior citizens are still in their homes, unable to have anyone to help them. I don't know if there's any way we can reach them. They don't, they're not maybe technically involved with uh, computers and I just don't know how, how we could get to those. And so just an outreach. Can I just jump in on that subject? Cause I think it's great. Cause I was out on uh, Saturday night in one of the establishments I was in, if uh, you had your vaccine, the workers didn't have to have the mask. I would say 95% of the workforce had the masks. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, I see Laura, maybe if you could publicize this with your resources, because I think there's a lot of workers in our downtown that I saw the bus in front of Old School Square over the weekend, just to get that message out there. Well, yeah. that is exactly what we were trying to do with this weekend. It was a populated weekend, and it was a weekend that we were hoping that got the word out to the to the restaurant um, workers because they could go in, grab their shot, and go to work, you know, and uh, be done with it. They we had the Johnson and Johnson available, one and done, so they didn't even have to return. I know that they're talking. The county's talking about doing this again. So if there's a way that we can make it uh, even more successful by getting those uh, those workers at the restaurants, um, you know, the opportunity, make sure that they know at least that there's an opportunity. Because they usually don't have the time in the middle of the day to get to um, to these appointments that are being made. So I, I think it's a great um, opportunity for us to be able to uh, get that done. So thanks for bringing that up. Pardon my interruption. Yeah, no problem. I, this is a 
group effort. Um, I'd like to make an additional uh, request of ICM Alvarez. I know it's hard, but uh, unless there's some kind of emergency, not to do any more hiring, you just want to leave it for whoever and whoever comes in to uh, take the mantle, and I don't know how they're going to operate. I know it seems to be there's always someone that, you know, they move and they don't like the new city manager. Hopefully we'll do a good job. And so if there's any um, hiring needs, if it's an emergency only, we'd just like to give him as much of an opportunity to do his own hiring. And I say he because they're all he. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't think you have any problem with that. You don't have any needs. There's no anything pending, like of uh, personnel that you have to replace. Um, uh, are you referencing citywide? Yes, citywide. Or... Well, citywide we have um, vacancies in, in many departments, and we are actively just trying to fill those vacancies mm -hmm. to ensure continuity of operations. Okay. Um, as long as they are open and funded, you know, and appropriated, that's how I intend to, to, to move forward. Continue. Okay. I don't know who we're going to hire, of course. Um, that person might need to give notice, so you might mm -hmm. be in your seat a little while longer, so I hope you'd hang in there and... And thank you for putting up with us. Um, Mayor and Commissioners, I ask consent to um, not conduct, and I don't know if uh, Mr. DeAndre has gotten with you. I understand there was a workshop planned for next Tuesday prior to the meeting, our city commission meeting. I would ask that that workshop uh, not be held because it's going to be very intensive and a lot of meeting time and interviewing and we're maybe wait this is a first i did i hear no. you clearly you do not I want know. a workshop well there have been a lot of switching around <laughs> tonight so i thought i'd join the crowd um whatever the subject is and i think it was king tide high tide or whatever yeah we were going to walls. give an update on the vulnerability assessment but we mm. could we can certainly move it to july if that's I, the will of the I, commission i think what he's doing is might Okay. Cause that cause us to push, push mm. it forward, and I don't want to reveal anything. But I met with um, Dwayne and Miss Bass, and I think we're going to have a great time because it's just going to be a lot of fun, a lot of round robin. Commissioner, uh, Vice, Deputy Mayor. Deputy I liked Vice it when you Mayor. said let's cancel the workshop. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay, consensus. You had him at consensus. that. Okay. <laughs> um, let's see, and one more thing. Secondly, I'd like to ask to have a workshop. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. She giveth and she taketh away. <laughs> I knew it was going to be um, a, a helpful thing. Everybody wants this um, item placed on the agenda to discuss the old school square property and uh, present contracted management. Uh, it has come to my attention that we may be negligent in proper oversight of one of our large, largest properties. And I'm not looking forward to it, but I think it's something that's long overdue. Thank you. So if we are having a July workshop, maybe we add that to a July workshop. If you have, if you want to discuss it, is there anybody that we need to bring in? To discuss the I don't know that workshop. they have even a director that's over there. That's one of the problems. I don't. We'd, I don't know what's going on there. I don't think we have a July that's... workshop, do we? No, not. no, I don't think so. Budget. It's the budget, oh, right? Oh. But I think we need to address and this as quickly as possible because um, there's something afoot, and we as well. You realize that next property. week is our last meeting before our July meetings, and then we have two July meetings, kind of I think back to back, and then we're done for another kind of stint. So. Um, I think it's important. I really so do. So I think what we could probably do, the July um, budget workshop, we could see if we extend the time or start a little earlier. Or we could even just add it, if you want to, to our regular meeting, one of the regular meetings in July. It's a, is discussion, a discussion item. item. Can we do that? Okay. And especially if it's a lighter one. And we do Let's intend to move up the time for the July workshop because we noticed that the workshop at uh, was scheduled for 3.30 and commission at 4, and that's certainly that's not enough time, time to do the budget workshop, so we're probably looking at 2 or 2.30. Okay. I prefer a workshop ahead of a meeting because okay. when we, if we like tonight, it's going on almost 7 o'clock. Anything Adam. else? Adam. <laughs> that's it. Thank you very all much. All right, very good. And I just have a couple of things I wanted to say. First of all, do um, any of my colleagues have the coin? 
Hmm. Everybody has one of these? Okay, so I'm going to give this to you because, I mean, I, I handed this out to, and we, we usually have these, so I just want you to give this to you. And you give it to this way, okay. okay? And you have to keep it on your person because if you're ever, you know, out with one of us and um, we're having drinks, all we have to do is put that coin on. Whoever doesn't have theirs, they buy the drinks. Ooh, so just so okay. you know how it goes. I uh, be having any drinks with you? Uh, so everybody else has their coins. <laughs> well, no, I thought you said you had one. <laughs> there you go. I'm supposed to. That's the way you do it, right? Like that. Okay, very good. You have one. I do. Okay, very good. All right, so. <laughs> um, okay, so um, that was the first thing. I wanted to also just um, recognize uh, Laura Simons in the audience and um, this really wonderful DDA event that you held um, at, at the uh, uh, the IPIC garage. You would not have believed it, um, everybody who didn't make it. It was really just amazing, and it was a really great celebration, and there was a couple of uh, significant um, uh, awards given, uh, one to Hans' uh, owner, um, uh, David Cook, and uh, also one to your dad, which I thought was really, and we also had one to, I believe it was Marjorie Ferrari too, if I'm not mistaken. So um, it was really just an incredible night, incredible evening, and a beautiful location that I would have never guessed would have turned out the way that it did. So congratulations. You did a great job there. May, um, may I interrupt? I read that they're going out of business. Oh. Hans. Yes, they are. They're closing down. They they were. Oh, they he's yeah, retiring, retiring and they sold. Yeah, yeah. The, they sold the building. They don't feel bad. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, second thing I wanted to mention was that we had our Memorial Day um, celebration yesterday, and I wanted just to um, give a quick uh, um, you know shout out to Parks and Rec, um, who do just an incredible job in the and the. Uh, uh, the crew at the uh, cemetery every year that we are able to do this and last year we weren't able obviously because of the covid but um before that and 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 the, even this year they do just a beautiful job of setting things up and of course um anthony zunker who really kind of organizes and does this he's also a troop leader a scout troop leader that puts the flags on each of the um the grave sites that uh, for anybody that served so it really is a, a, a real moving ceremony, and it was beautiful yesterday. We had gorgeous weather, was worried that it was going to rain because they were saying the rain was coming, but it, it avoided it just, just long enough for us to really enjoy um, that morning. Um, also wanted just to mention, um, again, I know it's already been mentioned here, Pride Month, and that we've got a um, kind of celebration, and right now the, the road on, um, I think it's Northwest First, I guess, is... Northeast, sorry, Northeast First is closed off at that intersection of First and Second um, as they are painting the sidewalk with the uh, Pride um, uh, logo. And uh, I'm really excited about that. That's coming up on June 12th. I know we're going to meet one more time before that, but can't hurt to mention it. There's also a woman's same, same day, Woman's uh, Veterans Day, at, will be hosted at the Elks Club. And there's a chili cook-off. So there's going to be, it's a busy, busy day of things going on. So anyway, uh, just put those in your schedule for anything, anybody who wants to show up. And I want to thank everybody. I know that today was, uh, tonight was not an easy night to go through. But um, again, um, thank you for the professionalism and for staying the course and, um, and for the decisions that you're making. Everybody's um, really done a great job. And so I appreciate that. Thank you. If there's nothing more, meeting adjourned.